our city council briefing, uh, you know, with uh, our, leg our wonderful legislative um, liaison, Deb Bryan. So if we can just go ahead and get rolling. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor, members of City Council. Happy Tuesday. So it, it's pretty much crunch time up here at the General Assembly, as you can imagine. Um, we have crossover starting next, uh, next week. So if we could have the presentation put up, that would be great. Okay, next slide, please, first slide. Okay, so it occurred to me that um, now that we're almost halfway there, um, having the stats every week didn't make too much sense unless we compared it against the last week. So you can see there's a lot of activity that's been going on. Most important numbers really are the uh, House bills and the Senate bills. Um, as the House bills, we still have about 75, well, about 75% have been cleared off the docket already, and in Senate, about 44%. So you can see we still have a ways to go, and we only have one week left until crossover. So um, basically marathon sessions from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or more. Um, so we still have uh, over 1,000 bills in the House and 300 in the Senate that need to be um, adjudicated. Next, please. Okay, here's some updates on um, the legislation we've been following and the legislation that you all had uh, requested. So the first House Bill 13, which Delegate Anderson carried for us, was the bill to raise the civil filing fee cap from $4 to $7 so that uh, we could fund our law libraries with uh, a little more funding. Well, um, unfortunately, that the, in the subcommittee, uh, that one was recommended to report 6 to 2, and in the full committee, um, it failed 10 to 10. Um, so unfortunately, a tie in uh, a, a tie in committee isn't uh, doesn't doesn't go to the the, uh, the the other side. So we lost that one. Um, so that one comes off, but we can we'll try it again next year. Um, House Bill 444. Um, that's Delegate Bennett Parker's. That's uh, to have virtual meetings um, for some of our, you know, any of our committees um, and uh, even for uh, during non-emergency states. Um, that one passed the House 98 to 0, um, which is a good thing. However, the companion bill at the Senate, 214, that was McPike's bill, that failed 19 to 21. So you can see that's going to be an issue when it goes over. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, these virtual meetings, and uh, the convenience is one thing, but there's a lot of, of uh, delegates and senators that do not want um, us to be able to have virtual meetings. So um, that one kind of hangs in the balance. The next one, House Bill 627, um, that uh, we uh, signed on to Delegate Hudson's bill. That was the one um, that was requested by the resort area, um, the violation of ordinances so that they could have civil penalties and ticket people who put their wares out on the sidewalks. Um, unfortunately, that one was also laid on the table five to four. Um, laid on the table isn't that it you know, didn't pass, but basically they passed it by for the year. Um, might be able to look at that again next year, but um, we did have some help from Alexandria in that one, and Alexandria wanted it as well, but unfortunately um, that one did not pass. House Bill 980, um, Delegate Williams Graves carried for us. That was for the, um, our housing complaints that had to do with uh, trash and, and things and trying to get a FOIA exclusion for those. Um, the, it was reported four to three from the subcommittee. And as you can tell, that's a pretty slim margin. It's actually up this afternoon in the full committee. We expect that it probably will meet the same fate. Not everyone is, uh, there, there's a lot of discussion about um, using it to complain about your neighbors and knowing that you have anonymity. Um, what we're trying to do is to get that one to move to the FOIA Council for a study, and that would be better than having it um, go away. Um, House Bill 1163, Delegate Greenhall carried that one in the House for us. That was the Board of Equalization Charter Amendment, and that one went through just fine. Um, it was uh, 22 to 0 uh, in the subcommittee, and now it's on the floor, and it should pass no problem. Senate Bill 537 and House Bill 1346, these were the tree canopies and giving us a little bit uh, localities more um, 
more leverage and the ability to have developers uh, replace trees. Both of those are kind of hanging and no one wants to uh, do anything about them in either the House or the Senate. Unfortunately, they're gonna have to, so they're both in subcommittees where they're sitting and we'll have to do something in the next week. Um, and then House Bill 978, that was the House version, uh, Durant's of the $20 million that um, is now currently going to HRT through the deeds um, tax or the, or the uh, filing fees for deeds um, in the house uh, that one uh, was ended up tw or in the house committee that one ended up 12 to 9 uh, it passed but then it was referred to appropriation so that one's still unknown um, both of the senate versions of that bill um, have been passed by for the year so um we're, we're still in a, a good place with that because this one, even if it does come through, when it gets to the Senate, it probably won't make it. Um, next, please. Okay, uh, House Bill 1362, I know I've spoken to several of you. You know that the uh, initial short-term rental bill that was put in by Senator DeSteff was, um, he withdrew it uh, based on the fact that there's some lawsuits going on. This was a new bill that was put in uh, right after that uh, by Delegate Wiley. It's been referred to a committee, um, but after um, sending it over to our city attorneys and uh, also uh, the planning, we've determined that um, there, there really is no um, nothing that impacts the city of Virginia Beach right now. Basically, all it says is if you don't already have an ordinance in place regarding your short term rentals, you can't have one since we already have an ordinance in place. Uh, this is not aimed at us and we are fine, but we will be monitoring that just to be sure that they don't change any language on us. Um, the next two, Senate Bill 557 and House Bill 605, the repeal of the same-sex marriage prohibition, uh, both of those have basically uh, been doing the same thing. They've been referred in and out of committees. Um, 557 was referred to finance and appropriations after it made it through privilege and and elections and um, in the house the same thing it's just been assigned to privileges and elections those both of those have to go through this year um, because they had to go through two years in a row um, as of right now it looks like they're probably going to be um, just hanging out and they might be continued to next year uh, it might be a political move so that they have to start all over again with the two years um, but we've already um uh, put in our support for those. Um, the next one, House Bill 635, the inclusionary housing that was brought up, uh, I believe it was last week, has been carried over to 2023. There is a new study that has been re released by the state. It's about 400 pages or so. If anybody would like it, I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, and they're going to be looking at the, that study before they make any decisions on the inclusionary, ha inclusionary housing. Um, and let's see, House Bill 1249. Uh, Delegate Davis, this is the one that uh, Ms. Henley brought to our attention, and it, uh, the students from several area Virginia Beach high schools uh, worked on this one, the environmental program. They were all at the hearing. Uh, they did a great job. It passed 10 to 0, and now it's on to the full committee. No reason to think that that, that one won't go through. Um, the next two you heard about last week from our city attorneys, um, Becky Kubin and Elizabeth Chupik, they've been working hard on these all week as we've been making changes. Um, Senate Bill 666, is there's been some changes made and some substitutes. It's up again tomorrow morning. Um, and that one, we're trying to, we're paring it down, working with a lot of other cities as well to be sure that um, it won't hurt us in ways as, as as bad as it was described last week. Um, and then Senate Bill 694, also a condemnation bill, um, has been changed a little bit, made a little bit more palatable. Our city attorneys have still um, recognized that there are some problems and we've shared that with our delegation. That in the subcommittee uh, went through and it's actually been engrossed on the floor. It hasn't been passed yet, but it has been has done the uh, statutory readings. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, okay, this was an, uh, these all went this morning, um, and actually our Commissioner of the Revenue, Phil Kellum, was here, and he testified in person for these, um, you know, not on behalf of the city, but on behalf of the Commissioners of Revenue Association, and uh, I think we came up with a really good, or they came up with a really good solution. Uh, all three of these bills um, got merged together into uh, Senator Vogel's Bill 651. They included um, all the transient occupancy tax 
uh, for the short term rentals. They changed the definition of accommodations intermediary to be um, hotels, any, um, any short term rentals all of that. They also included the supporting documentation so that our commissioners of the revenue will get the property addresses, the gross receipts, and they'll get these remitted to the locality monthly instead of quarterly. Um, the definition of room charge is now exactly what the customer pays before taxes. They don't have all that language in there about um, you know, different uh, different things that the intermediary is cheap, and then they don't have to pay tax on that. So they'll have to pay tax on everything. Um, so so those look good coming out of the the Senate. Um, we still have the ones in, in the House that are being dealt with, and they're both in the finance committees. Okay, next. Okay, um, and these last week, um, we so so as you can see, some of our long list of bills that may have needed direction last week has been getting much smaller because as time goes on, they just kind of taking care of themselves. So so that's a good thing. Um, the tax. Uh, Gas tax bills, um, the one in the house has been tabled. Uh, the other one is referred to finance. We're not sure what's going on with it. The lowering of the gas tax, um, that house bill and Senate bill, bill there, House Bill 1144 and 541 are still lingering. So um, as of right now, there's just discussions and nothing's really moving forward with those. Um, the sales tax exemption for food, the grocery tax, those are the next um, four bills that I have there. I don't know why I put them in yellow. That doesn't really mean anything. I think I just, I don't know why I did that. In any case, um, what happened today, those were, those were also in committee first thing this morning. And the three Senate bills, let me see, make sure I have my, that's not right. Okay, so Senate Bill 380, 571, and 609 were all combined together. Um, and the this tax, which would be the food tax, which is two and a half percent, uh, the last, they were trying to make substitutes on the floor because as you can see, some of those bills replaced some of the revenue, some didn't. Um, just as a reminder, the two and a half percent is made up of 1% of the local option. And in all cases in the combined bill that will remain. So the 1% local option you can, we can still do or not do. Um, the 1% that goes to schools their uh, recommendation was to get rid of that and take it from the general fund because the state, meaning take it from the state's general fund and that 1% that went back to uh, cities for use at schools. So that would, the city would be made whole on that 1%. And because we have plenty of, or they have plenty of cash in the state coffers, they would take that 1% for schools and give it back to the cities, uh, the localities. And then the half penny, um, that went for transportation, that would go away. So that was the last proposal. Um, instead of making a decision on the fly, this committee meets again tomorrow. So they decided they would think about it overnight. And so we'll figure out, or at least on the floor, what's gonna happen uh, tomorrow on that. So if you do have any thoughts and you want us to express those tomorrow morning, uh, as far as the, the food tax, please let me know. So that would be one that, um, it, as opposed to the ones before that, uh, the gas tax, they're really, like I said, is no activity, but this one is active, the grocery tax. Um, so any any uh, input you have on that. And then the last um, House Bill 1031, Davis's bill um, that was referred to privileges and elections for the school board, we understand that one is actually coming up in committee probably tomorrow or the next day. And then the one we heard from um, our officers last week, the emergency custody orders, that one was continued at the request of the patron. So we'll take that one back up next week. And next. Um, and I believe that is it. Uh, I think there was only one other thing that I wanted to tell you all about. Um, and that was the governor's tax rebate proposal. Um, the 1.2 billion proposal for a one-time taxpayer rebate um, that was introduced. Okay. Oh, it says I have to start video. Oh, hello. Um, so anyway, that one was uh, introduced um, by uh, Robinson of Chesterfield and re referred to um, the House Appropriations Committee. Um, and the subcommittee decided to continue the proposals by the uh, Senators Norman and Suterline. And basically what that means is they hit the pause button on this legislation 
so a special subcommittee on tax policy could study it. So we won't be looking for that this year. That will be probably coming next year. And that's it. Any questions? Board, as always, any questions? Mr. Moss. Yes. Did the standard deduction increase, which was separate from the one-time rebate, was that also addressed by the Finance Committee this morning? Not, but I will find out what is happening with that because they are meeting again tomorrow morning. It would be a light bait, but I don't want to assume anything. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, Deb, that was great. Mr. Dehaney. So, Deborah, um, is Mr. Belucci, do you have a question? Okay. No, I was just saying hi to some people. Okay. Deborah, <laughs> um, which items did it's you make when from you NAMI. raise your hand? Yeah. What happens at this <laughs> <laughs> Deborah, which items do you need direction from the council on? So the one that the only ones really up tomorrow is, uh, as I would mentioned, is the grocery tax. If there's any stance that you want to take on that with regard to um, either the one percent local option, the being made whole, any any of that that you want to opine on. That's open. Well, what's the best, Mr. Moss? Well, I'm sure this this body doesn't want to give back any revenues, but we can address that as a separate topic because we have the local option under the current ordinance to do that. So that's a debate for another day. So I would support repealing that and helping out low income people on food tax, but that's a debate for another day. But if the state is holding, if a proposal that meets the vote, that's the question, holds us harmless and they're replacing that out of the increase in revenues, it's hardly difficult to oppose something that's fiscally neutral and uh, provides relief to those who, who are most impacted by a very regressive food tax. That's just my view, but I've already expressed that to people up in the General Assembly. They, they know where I stand. So, Ms. Wilson. And I, I agree with Mr. Moss that if it's holding us harmless, uh, I, I definitely would support it. Okay, does the council agree that the uh, direction is we will go with it as long as the uh, council is held harmless? Is that a one year hold harmless or ongoing? Good question. Deborah, did you hear the question from Councilmember Branch? He asked if it's um, a one year hold harmless or is it ongoing for multiple years? So that was a good question that was also raised in the committee. We're talking about the. It, it's actually a one and a half percent. The half percent you will not be held harmless on. It just goes away. The one percent that goes back to schools is the part that they were going to hold harmless on. And the thought was that it would be forever. But it was also mentioned in committee that we don't know that we will have that kind of money uh, in the state coffers forever. So basically, it's really just a guarantee for the biennium. After that, we don't know. Yeah, Mr. Dehaney. Deborah, did you say it's a hold armless only for schools? So the two and a half percent is the total amount. One and a half percent of that, one percent comes back to the uh, localities that goes to schools, and a half goes to transportation. The half that goes to transportation will just go away. There is no hold harmless. The one percent that goes to schools is what they will backfill from the general fund for the biennium and maybe longer. The other 1% go? You said transportation? No, no, that's no. a half a percent. The 1% we, we have by ordinance, we can decide to have or not. That's a local option, and we have an ordinance that has it in place. That's when I said that's a debate for another day, because that's totally in our control, and that comes all to us. Okay. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think there's, from, from my, at least from my understanding, there's a lot, there's, there's still a lot that has to be worked out. Um, as far as, you know, whether we're, not, we're going to be held harmless on the 1%. Um, and I think we need to understand what that means to our city in its entirety. I, I you know, I would like to hold a, a neutral position until they know what they're doing at the state level before we decide to, to take a position. Okay. Uh, you know, John? My only comment is, remember, in the end, while we're holding ourselves as a city harmless, in the end, this is someone else's money who earned it. It's the people paying the grocery tax, and it's the people least at the bottom of that income distribution thing 
to disproportionately pay it the most. So while we can defer, that's fine, because everybody can express their own opinions. I'm just telling you, in the end, the, the pain that's inflicting, given the current inflationary period is, the people at the bottom of our income distribution system, and I know there's all sorts of other compensation. If you look at the GAO, there's about $16,250 of transfer payments on an annual basis that goes to the bottom 20% from the feds. But still, if you talk to people out there every day, you know, it's, it sounds like we are, that uh, us keeping money isn't as important to me as people who earn it keeping it. But I understand the view of the body, but I've, I've expressed my view individually, and I'm sure all of you will do the same. Ms. Henley. Well, I'm not smart enough yet to know what the view of the body is. I think we have yet to decide that. Um, but I think I would love to do away with all of these taxes. You know, we the, the personal property tax and the and the beef hole tax and the and the food tax. But I know that we can't do away with taxes, and we've got to have a certain amount of money to provide the services that our people expect. I would just like for us, with any of these decisions, to have what it's going to mean dollar-wise to us because that's the only way we can really tell. Mm -hmm. And really, until we get into the budget mm -hmm. and we know what the General Assembly has done and what our needs are, that's when, mm -hmm. when the rubber will hit the road and we're going to have to decide what we can do and what we can't. Mm -hmm. uh, but doing each of these things piecemeal just doesn't work, as far as I'm concerned, unless we know what it means to us in dollars. And, uh, I mean, for example, I'm, I'm glad they're going to be holding the schools harmless, um, but uh, that has a tendency to not be forever and come back to the, the city, biennial. too. Mm -hmm. I really think with each of these, we've got to know exactly what it means to the city. Mm -hmm. and, and by the city, I mean the citizens, because if we don't have the money, then that means we're not going to be able to provide the services. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's got to be some tough choices made. There's no question about it. But I think we need to have all of the data in order to make those choices. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, Mr. Branch? Well, and, and it looks like the half a percent for transportation is gone. And so I'd like to know what impact that has on, mm -hmm. and do we know what 1% of the uh, grocery tax is to us? Do we, do we have a number for that? I'll get it for you. Okay. So would it be prudent at this point to kind of hold moving forward with a direction at this point until a thing? But, Mr. Moss, you had your hand up. Yeah. I, I have always been assertive about a one-to-end looking at a wholesale fashion, but last Tuesday we didn't do that. So I'm having a hard time finding the consistency in this body's action. That's my closing argument. Yes. Deborah, are there any other items that you need direction from the council on? No, I think that's it. And um, as of now, what I'm hearing is let's remain. I'm remaining neutral, and I will just report back to you what happens. I can tell you that I believe there's going to be a lot more discussion on this one, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's tabled tomorrow in the committee and they study it further because the questions that you have had is the question that everyone's had, which is what does this mean in dollars and cents? And it's very difficult to discern that right now. ML have a position on this? Excuse me? ML have a position on this? Yes, VML is opposed. Okay, anyone else at this point? Okay, I think we have a direction going forward. Any other questions or concerns for Ms. Bryant? Okay, thank you, Ms. Bryant. Okay, moving on to our next briefing, uh, Virginia Beach Community De Development Corporation and National Alliance of Mental Illness and Proposed Project. Good afternoon. Hey, how are you? How are you? Good afternoon. Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, and all your council members, Mr. Branch, Mr. Berlucci, Mr. Tower, Ms. Wooten. 
Mr. Luce, Jones, it's good to see you again. Ms. Henley and Mr. Roth, Hol Holcomb, Ms. Roth, thank you for having taken the time. So we're just going to briefly go over uh, the BBCDC and the NAMI proposal that you received in your packet. Um, and I'm just going to go over kind of the history and talk a little bit about the background, um, a little bit about the project, and then I will invite Kathy Warren from Economic Development up to go around the site. So this proposal um, is from NAMI, as you heard, the National Alliance um, for uh, Mental Illness and VBCDC, who is a nonprofit that does development work for low-income housing here in our city. And the, um, this is a mixed income, uh, mixed use affordable housing project. Um, with those two organizations. And NAMI serves the mental health, uh, mental health community here in our region, and they are offering free services for people with mental illness. That includes peer support. It includes um, classes. It also will have a dedicated, thank you, a service coordinator on site in this project to help with uh, securing needs for those that are staying there. Uh, so a little bit about the background. Um, NAMI reached out to, was in conversations with um, human services around the need for more um, housing for this population, this targeted mental health population. Um, and they also contacted DHMP around a, a project and what it could look like. Um, so in the spring, there was conversations around this, um, this issue, and then you guys may have remembered that there was ARPA funding that was uh, went out to the community. NAMI did put in a request for ARPA funding through the city manager's office. Um, at that time, they were looking at another site. That site was not considered appropriate for this project, um, and so it, it did not go any further than that. Um, part of that, and I'll go back, was that you can see the site, um, the Joint Navy Review found that it was not, it was not compatible with their sub area three, so that's why it didn't go forward. It was a, the Beach Health Clinic, which um, was on Rosemont Road, you guys, or excuse me, Holland Road, you guys might be familiar with it, and they were willing to um, sell that to NAMI. Um, so the great thing about this is that it is a mixed use, mixed income proposal. Um, it is going to be up to 60 units, potentially, uh, 45 to 60, and then up to 15% um, or eight units could be for people that are experiencing um, issues with mental health. Um, the remaining of the units will be affordable at up to 80% area median income, and VBCDC will actually own and manage the property and the maintenance services. NAMI will have an anchor leasee of and they will have office space in the building, and, which will include their regional headquarters. It is going to be an energy efficient um, building, um, green building, and there will be some units designed for persons with physical or sensory um, disability. So I'm going to allow Kathy to come up and share with you about the site criteria, and then we can answer any clarified questions you may have. Hey, good evening. We just thought it was important to bring to you uh, what we are looking for in a site in order to have a discussion with NAMI and potentially the CDC and Department of Housing and Neighborhood Preservation uh, when it comes to moving forward with any type of program. We are looking at sites between 1.5 to 5 acres in order to develop a mixed use project that would hold up to 60 units. Uh, the site would uh, have to be either zoned B4 or, com or compatible to rezone to a B4 zoning, uh, which is a mixed-use district. Uh, it would be ha it would have to be located out of the above 75 acres noise zone, consistent with the policies of the comprehensive plan, <laughs> located near or on a transit route, and close to amenities and medical faci facilities. So that's what we're looking for when we're looking to, to um, review a site with the groups that are involved for a potential project. Okay. Any questions? I'll, I'll okay, yield. Mr. Bellucci and then Mr. Moss. I'll yield to Mr. Tower. Um, okay, I didn't see Mr. Tower's hand. Mr. Bellucci, Mr. Tower, Mr. Moss. Thank you, Senator. 
Well, I'll I'll be happy to yield to Mr. Tower, but I'd like to make a what's few this Congress? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to, I like to make a few remarks and acknowledgments when he's finished with this question, if that would be okay. Uh, uh, I'm not sure why I deserve to be yielded to quite so, but I think I think you had, I your, think, hand, you had your hand up. First. I thank the gentleman. I, I think that they did that back in the night stage yeah. and everything. I thank the gentleman very much. Uh, I, I would just like to ask the question, looking at these site criteria, what are, are there any, are any of these a different site criteria than you would s look for any kind of affordable housing development? Are any of them unique to the NAMI request or other health requests? I see ne being near medical facilities might be, but. I think one of the most important is obviously the zoning for such a project because it is going to be mixed use, meaning it's going to have residential and an office component. But the other one is the transit route to make sure that we have public transit available to the residents. But w wouldn't you want to do that yes. for almost any affordable housing type? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm all for this. I'm, I mean, I'm very supportive of it, but I'm all, I was just looking at an ad in, uh, whatever the Richmond equivalent of inside business is, that publication is sponsoring a conference coming up on affordable housing. And I just noticed there were dozens and, I mean, literally dozens of sponsors and participants in the, in the program, uh, lots of speakers. I mean, a big, big deal. And I'm just, one of the things I was kind of wondering is, well, why don't why aren't why am not why am I not seeing a big community wide push for affordable housing? I keep hearing about it, but I don't see you know the sort of community uh, or the interest in the private sector as much as maybe in Richmond as well. I'm sure there are lots of reasons for that. Maybe you could tell me some about it. But I, I didn't raise the question so much about this project, which I support, but really to kind of trying to get a feel on a broader basis for what we are looking for for affordable housing. And I'm sure we must be, uh, if we're not running out of sites, we will be soon, uh, at least in this city. Um, and I'm wondering what the community is doing generally about affordable housing. That sort of is my question. But I'm just looking at this list and saying, is this any different than you would for any other af affordable housing project? I'm trying to educate myself. Well, again, I think the mixed-use component is important here. If we were looking for apartments, we'd look, be looking for apartment zoning here because we have that mixed-use. That's why we're calling and out And is the mixed-use sought here for because of the office component for NAMI itself? Yes. Okay, I get it. But, th but that, could be a, that could be an attractive feature, perhaps, of any kind of affordable housing development. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Mr. Bellucci, Mr. Moss. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you, Ms. Hill and Ms. Warren, for your presentation and for the work you did to get us to this point today. Uh, it's very important, and I'm very grateful for it. I also want to thank Mr. Duhaney um, for his leadership and, um, and diligence on this uh, initiative and this discussion, as well as my colleague and friend, Council Member Moss, who's been a champion for this project with affordable housing and a mental health component um, generally. And I want to take this opportunity, before I go further, to recognize um, Jen Williams from the National Alliance for Mental Illness and Jessica Guglielmo from Virginia Beach Community Development Corporation. Thank you both for being here today. I think your presence reflects your commitment not only to this particular initiative but to the issue of affordable housing and um, serving people who live with mental illness and their families generally in Virginia Beach. You are both leaders, uh, visionary leaders and committed public servants and I, I thank you for being here and I thank you for bringing this topic um, to our attention today and for remaining in conversation on this very important project. I, I just want to say that one of the things that I learned from Ms. Williams particularly and the entire folks team at NAMI who I've been working with for many years prior to even um, becoming involved as a member of City Council <laughs> is that housing is fundamental to the question of, of mental illness. And mental illness and mental health affects every person, it affects each of us, those of us around this dais, it affects our family members, it affects the people we work with and our colleagues. Um, it certainly affects people who find themselves in a situation where they're incarcerated and 
um, and, and uh, in our jail system. It affects every aspect of our, of our community. And in many cases, one of the fundamental missing elements um, that sets people onto the right path to recovery and to living healthy with mental health is the question of housing. Because without housing, without permanent supportive housing, the other aspects of care and treatment just aren't effective. And so the project like this is transformational, not only for the people's lives who live with mental illness, but also for the families and for the people they work with and for our community at large. And I think what you're also doing here is addressing the question of affordable housing and um, in mixed use in a very healthy, productive, best practice way. And um, I, th I know we still have work to do on this, um, but I really want to challenge the city council and I want to challenge our community to get behind this effort to raise awareness about one of the most critical and um, I think under um, resourced aspects of, um, of our society and that's mental health and, uh, and really get behind this effort and make some positive change in the lives of Virginia Beach families because that's what we're doing here. Something to be really proud of. I think it's innovative. I think it's a, it's a partnership between the city of Virginia Beach, between private nonprofit providers, between a public-private partnership like VBCDC. I think it could be a model, not only for Virginia Beach and Virginia, but for our country even. And I think Virginia Beach is, is placed in, a, in a, such a way that we could be transformative leaders on the issue of mental health, and permanent supportive housing is, is key to that. I could go on and on, but if you don't have housing, you don't have access to permanent supportive housing, then you're much more likely to find yourself in a situation where you're going to have an interaction with law enforcement. You're much more likely to not have stable employment. You're much more likely to have disruptions in your family life. So this, this is a key element to providing access to care and ensuring that we are um, the city that we say we are when we talk about supporting people. So I love it. I thank you very much, and I'm really proud to um, to be here with you today while we explore this concept. Thank you very much. Mr. Moss, and then Mr. Holt. Well, first of all, I want to ditto on all of Michael's comments and also to the staff. We held a workshop, it seems like two or three months ago. Time here just travels, <laughs> but it was some time ago. Uh, I do have two observations. One, I've, I've mentioned it several times here before, the median income in Virginia Beach is much higher than the area. So when we say 80% of the area median income, that it really needs to be 80% of our city's median income. I know that might run us afoul of some federal grants. We need to know when that's the case. But when that's not the case, we need to bump that up because really affordable housing in Virginia Beach has a much different definition than in our area cities. And we need to make sure that, that there's 20% of those people in our community maybe that would qualify in Norfolk to get housing, but they can't get housing here. So I, I always like us to be attentive to that. I don't know many places we can get 60 units on one and a half acres, but I know where most of the B4 current our strategic plan is located. I don't know that we own many properties in those areas, but I think the first step is actually an assessment of what properties that we do own that match that criteria. Maybe that's not the highest and best use, but we might make a different choice knowing that this is an, another kind of choice. Um, I'm, I couldn't be more pleased with how competent our community development corporation is working. That board just has just done miraculous work, so I have great confidence that they can pull that off. Uh, but I think it will be important also to know the, the business model, because I know the clients are probably principally Medicaid clients, I suspect. So that would be good to know that business model income stream that makes it all work. I know we had a recent project that we had to pull back our grant of $1.5 million for because that project didn't happen. I don't know that that grant would be applicable, Mr. Dehaney, to this kind of effort, may or may not be, but I suspect that, that the land in that, and I know that Virginia Beach Community Development Corporation, if they have paying clients and also long-term leases, and can go to the banks and to the, or HUD or other places and get long-term money. So I think that's the business model we got to have. But first it comes up, Mr. Dehaney, of are there sites? Because we don't have many tools, as many of you know, to talk about affordable housing. We don't control interest rates. We don't control down payments. We don't control any of those things, which really is our tax credits 
So it comes down to land is something we can control or possibly offer. And if it comes and it's already impervious surface or it already has water and sewer, all those costs come off the table. So I think key, the next step is the survey, I think, to look at do we have land? Because if we don't, and you look at the places you're looking for, those are not inexpensive properties. And they're probably not vacant, <laughs> to be honest with you. So I think that's the, the big, the long pole in the tent is land and coming back and telling us what our, what our options are, working with obviously the two organizations. Right, and if I may, Councilman, we have done, we've started the process of an initial survey. We have located at least one city-owned site that is vacant. We just, uh, we need to work with NAMI and see if it's suitable for their needs. Oh, very good. I appreciate all the hard work you're doing. This is not an easy thing to solve given the criteria and given where land is in the city, but thank you. If I may. I'll tell you, if it's okay, Mr. Sorry. Holcomb, Mr. Rouse, and then I will get to you. I, I would be interested in seeing where, what matrix you use to get the 60, the 60 units, because I honestly think that th that's way underserved in the mental health community right now. I know that we could empty our city jail right now with, with 60 beds right now. So my thing is, and I understand that the, uh, the land is, is, is an issue and, and money's always an issue, but I think on something this important, because we've watched in the law enforcement community and over the past 20 years, this has been our biggest struggle is dealing with this mental health problem. And I think that if we're going to shoot our shot on this, we need to shoot it big for the future because if it's growing the way it has grown, I, I think 60 beds would be be full in no time and, and and I just think that we got to think big big plan here moving down the road because it's huge so um, the proposal is from BBCDC in partnership with NAMI they submitted to us a quick fact sheet of what their proposal was so I can't really speak to the details of the development How, however I will tell you that if you look at the proposal just what I put in the project only 15% of them would be for that seriously mentally ill um, and everybody else would be in that low income range. And one of the reasons for that is that you don't want to concentrate either poverty or people with mental illness in a project unless you have really strong, intense support services with it. And that, that doesn't look like that's the way they're doing this project because it's mixed income, mixed use. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I think I saw NAMI will be in site with, with an office in site with counselors and whatever they have there yeah, correct. deal with it. Yeah. Which, which is even more concerning because when you say, 15%, that's even a lower number than what we're talking about. If I mean, it's 60 units, it's, it comes up to nine. Yeah, and nine, that. Nine is what you yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rouse, and then Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first of all, thank you, ladies. Um, thank you for what you do for mental health, and especially housing in Virginia Beach is, is a huge issue. Um, I think we all understand and know where I stand at on the situation of affordable housing and how we need to destigmatize that word affordable when you talk about housing, um, but just how also important workforce housing is to, to our community. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad Mr. Holcomb here um, brought up the fact of, of what our sheriff's office has done with, with under the you know, command of Sheriff Stolle with the low recidivism rate because of they understand just how important mental health is um, and getting folks like that help. Um, here, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to build the two together. You look at affordable housing, but you also have NAMI, a great organization, <laughs> making sure you are really um, um, trying to find the healthy ways to mitigate those health concerns um, as well. So this is something that I, I definitely um, support. Uh, on top of that, I, I think it would be you know incumbent upon, upon the city council to look at affordable workforce, workforce housing throughout the city. And, and making sure we can actually find ways and, and fund mental health, not just from a housing standpoint as well, but just in terms of having a healthy community. Um, and, and I know that's something that, you know, coming outside of this pandemic, everyone is discovering about themselves, being in the house for quite some time, understanding the mental, um, mental challenges that, that accompany with that. And so mental health uh, affects us all, as Councilman Bellucci said, and I think it would be uh, a a good step towards um, from this council to make sure we are adequately um, approaching that with, with serious and intentional efforts. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jones. Uh, did you say you had identified a site at me or? We did. We identified one site, uh, city owned, vacant land, 
And then we also looked at the private market to see if there was anything out there for sale that we could at least pass on to NAMI. So the one vacant they said that they're looking at now and they think it, it could potentially work. At that point, if we get further along in the conversation, we'll bring that to council to see if, if you would agree with that site. Is it publicly owned or is it? It's city owned. Yes. Thank Anybody you. else? Mr. Branch. How would you get applicants for this housing? And would the Housing Resource Center be part of this continuum? Um, we haven't gone down that route yet. There is a process with um, um, DHS, with mental health services through behavioral health, that I'm sure we will connect them to those that are on waiting lists and see if we're making sure that people are connected to our system. Um, but we haven't talked those details yet. yet. But we will. Thank you, Mr. Branch. Okay, Mr. Bellucci. Mr. Mayor, and I, I don't want to veer too off script, so if anyone objects to this, please don't hesitate to let me know. But since we do have Ms. Williams and Ms. Guglielmo here, I wonder if they would consider, particularly on the question of the need for the housing, um, if you would consider just putting a finer point on the question of why did you bring this to the city in the first place, and how would you envision, for example, getting the applicants and managing the system, and what impact would the offices have on our community? And so if no one has any objections, I'd like to invite them just to share a few thoughts. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, thank you. Well, I know they thank can you. take Thank you. She's great on the board. And thank you both very much. And welcome, and come on up, and boy, we at the dais are used to be putting on the spot. So thank you, thank Good you all so you. much. And I, it's so heartwarming to see that you all are in favor of this. I cannot thank you enough because I work in the office, and <clears throat> we get call after call from both parents of grown children who are not able to take care of themselves. They're not violent people. They're people who, because of their mental health difficulty, just aren't able to navigate the world well, you know? And they don't know what are they going to do. Uh, I have a son who has a mental illness, and he's not able to take care of himself. And I worry about that because I'm older. What are we going to do? We get those phone calls all the time. Or we get a phone call from <clears throat> someone who has uh, younger children in their home, and they have someone who is st partially stable, not quite there yet, but they can't bring them back in their house. Where are they going to go? What do I do? And it's so frustrating and so heartbreaking to me when I get those calls because I don't know what to tell them. I don't know where, where are you going to go. Are you going to go under the underpass? Or, you know, like Mr. Holcomb was talking about, they end up in jail because they break the law in some way. And rather than being surrounded and supported and lifted up, they're penalized. Um, I, don't want to, I don't want to waste all your time and keep talking about this. I could talk about this forever, but mental illness is not a, it's not a character flaw. It's not a behavior choice. It's an illness, just like a physical illness. And if they could live without it, they would. My son said, do you think that I would choose to be this way? Is this the way I want to live my life? No. Nobody does. Everybody wants to be a productive member of society. And if we can help them get there, it will help all of us. It will help us financially because they're not going to be dependent on us for money. They'll be able to work because they have a place to live. They don't have to live in their car. So I, again, thank you. Thank you. I cannot thank you all enough for considering this and working with us. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else at Ms. this point? Ms. if if... I'd like just to give her the opportunity to share a little bit about the CDC component. Sure. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us here today. When NAMI approached us, it was like the perfect marriage because our expertise, <clears throat> excuse me, is affordable housing. And um, knowing that the need is great to house persons with a mental health diagnosis, we have a few developments that we already provide housing. Um, in concert with the city's human services department, we know that the need is strong and the need continues. So being able to marry up affordable housing for low-income folks with the specific need that NAMI brought to us, it, it was, you know, a marriage for us. 
As far as referrals go, um, referrals could come directly through the NAMI office or they could come through the city's housing resource center. And so that's how we envision um, that folks would be placed into those 10 or so specified units for persons with a mental health diagnosis. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me just say thanks to all of you. This is a first step of many that are going to be necessary, but you got to take the first step. That's right. And, you know, we had a situation prior to COVID with mental health. Mm -hmm. There's been a number of mental health issues in my immediate family. And let me just say, COVID didn't make it any uh, easier, did it? No. It, it touches everything. It, it really kind of exacerbated uh, the entire situation. But once again, I think it's pointed out, but you know, I, I commend my colleagues here for their advocacy of this, because once again, you know, this is going to be so vital and what makes Virginia Beach sub, such a vibrant and livable community is the inclusion of everyone that needs city services. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you all. Okay. Okay, Mr. Manager. Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, members of our budget department, starting with Kevin Chatelier, is gonna update council on the city's current grant process. This came about during the budget guidance presentation that we had back in November. City council, members of city council asked for an update on the various different programs that we have and how they function and how they work. Hey, how you doing? Doing well, how are you? Great, thank you. All right. Oh. Oh. Oh, no. Pulled up. <laughs> Michael, don't forget to introduce yourself. Of course. <laughs> we have the ways you can just reference the slide number. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So good afternoon, Mayor, members of council. My name is Michael Evans. I am a budget and policy analyst with the city's budget management services department. I serve as the staff liaison for Mike. the city's. Um, Last thing, bring your mic down. Yep. Oh. Oh. So I serve as the staff liaison for the city's uh, community organization grant review committee, and I'm also the main point of contact for the city's uh, community service micro grant program and regional grant program. So today I'm here to provide you all with a little bit of background on these three programs, including some of the history and the application process for all three. And then of course at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll be looking for some guidance from you all on how to proceed with the program. And of course, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. So, so the city provides funding to nonprofit organizations through these three programs. Um, it's important to note that these three programs are not inclusive of all the support that's provided by the city. Uh, this does not include the Arts and Humanities Commission or any programs that were established using CARES Act funding or American Rescue Plan Act funding. So I'm going to begin by reviewing the Community Organization Grant Program. So the Community Organization Grant Program was established by City Council in 1993, and the intention of the program was to encourage nonprofit organizations to provide services that improve the quality of life for Virginia Beach residents. Only nonprofit organizations are eligible to apply for this grant, and they're required to submit different service delivery and financial reports to our department. These reports can include, of course, during their application process, IRS determination of nonprofit status, their most recent filings with the IRS, proof of registration with the Department of Consumer Services through the Commonwealth of Virginia, and audited financial statements. In addition to this, they're required to submit uh, measures that show that funding will support Virginia Beach residents, and the organization is also not eligible to receive this grant if they're receiving a grant from another city grant organization or grant program. So for example, if an organization was receiving a grant from our regional grants program, they would not be eligible to receive a grant through the community organization grants program. Uh, funding for this program was established in FY18 at $1.10 per capita. So what this translated to in the current fiscal year is about $501,000 in funding. So getting into the process a little bit, 
uh, once applications are received, they are first reviewed by Budget Management Services, and then they are reviewed by the Community Organization Grant Committee. This committee is made up of 10 members, including one member of City Council, in this case by Sarah <coughs> Wilson, uh, one citizen at large selected by the mayor, four citizens at large selected by the council as a whole, the director of public health, and one representative each from the United Way, the Library Board, and the Hampton Roads Community Foundation. These 10 members are responsible for making the funding decisions among the applications that are received. And one interesting fact is that Virginia Beach has the only council appointed committee for grant allocations in the region. So as far as what the schedule looks like for this grant program, uh, the committee has had one meeting so far this year for FY23 to review the schedule and to review the entire grant process. We actually opened up applications for community organization grants yesterday, and the application window is going to remain open through March 25th. Uh, when the application process begins, our communications office publishes notice in the beacon. They also post notice on the city website and on city social media pages to let organizations know that this application is now available. When the application period ends, I'm responsible for reviewing the applications for compliance and ensuring that all the appropriate documentation was provided. Then in mid-April, I will provide these applications to the committee for their review. They'll have several weeks to review these applications, and then the committee meets in early May to both discuss the applications and to interview candidates. It's at that time they'll also make their funding decisions. Once the committee makes these decisions, the city council and the organizations who applied are notified in early June of their funding decisions, and the uh, organizations are able to request payment on July 1st. So this next slide shows a history of grants for community organization grant funding. And as you can see, as I mentioned earlier, in FY22, there was about $501,000 in funding. Now, to put this figure in perspective, in FY22, we received 24 total applications with $1.4 million in total requests. And of that, 21 requests, totaling $1.1 million, were qualified applicants. So using the funding available, the committee was able to fully fund nine of those requests and partially fund four of those requests. Now, if you were able to, or if you were to compare the nonprofit support provided by the city of Virginia Beach with other cities in the region, at first glance, if you were to compare community organization grants with those programs, it would look like other cities provide more support. But most cities combine all of their grants into one program, so they would combine what we refer to as community organization grants with regional grants, which I'll discuss later. So the next grant program I'm going to talk to you about is the Community Service Micro Grant Program. This grant program began in FY18 and really serves as an entry point to the city's grant programs. Um, organizations that may not necessarily meet the more stringent requirements of the community organization grant or organizations that are newer and may not have the financial history that's required to apply for the community organization grant can apply for this particular opportunity. They still all have to be verified nonprofits, but they do not have to provide as much documentation during their application process. And awards for this grant range from about 200, well, they range from a minimum of $250 to a maximum of $5,000. Now, in order for an organization to submit an application, they do have to have a sponsor on city council, but the final award has to be voted on by the entire body. $20,000 is uh, budgeted annually for this program, and since its inception, 10 grants have been distributed, one each in FY18, 19, and 20, three in FY21, and one so far in FY22. As I mentioned just a minute ago, this really does serve as an entry point for a lot of organizations. So with that in mind, organizations can apply multiple years in a row for this grant opportunity. However, no organization can receive more than $10,000 in total funding from this opportunity. So, for example, if an organization were to apply for and receive this grant and for $5,000 in FY22, and then next year they were to apply for and receive the grant again, they would no longer be eligible in FY24. Now, the final grant category we have are regional grants. These grants provide funding to nonprofits, local colleges and universities, and to other organizations that both complement city services and align with city council initiatives. In your most recent Friday packet, you were provided with a list of all regional grant awards in the current fiscal year. 
And if you had the opportunity to look at those, you may have seen that funding for some of these organizations dates as far back as 1961. Um, there is an annual application for this grant process, but the application is a fairly simple application and really just is provides the budget department with a record to keep on file. Um, this record includes the application, the, their, mo their most recent 990, and audited financial statements. Generally speaking, once an organization has received this grant funding from council, they will continue to receive it each year until council decides otherwise. These grants are approved annually during the budget process, and the regional grants are listed out in the non-departmental section of the operating budget. As with the community organization grants, this slide shows a history of funding for regional grants. As you can see, current year funding was about $3.4 million. One thing to keep in mind here is much like with the other grant programs, this is not the full picture of organizational support provided by the city. Uh, some support for these regional organizations is embedded within city departments. So for example, HRT is embedded in our planning department and Hampton Roads Planning District Commission is embedded in both public works and public utilities. And then this slide here shows individual contributions to organizations in FY22, as well as the year funding began for these organizations. As you can see, we have organizations here like Hampton Roads Planning District Commission and EVMS that date back to the 60s and 70s. And then we have organizations that we added as recently as last year, like Hampton Roads Pride and Eggleston. So now that I've presented you with all of that information, we would like some guidance from you all, not only for this year, but for future budget processes. Specifically, would council like to modify any of the processes or funding for these different programs? And of course, are you all comfortable with the current uh, regional grant recipients? So with that, I would like to thank you all for your time, and I'm looking forward to your input on these questions, and of course, I'm happy to take any questions Pardon you may me. have. Ms. Henley, then Mr. Rowe. Well, when I was reading this, I thought, my goodness, somebody has done some research. I compliment <laughs> you on, on being able to track all of this down. Um, it's, it's good that we've got all of this compiled here so that we kind of see what has grown over the years. I remember, I seem to remember back when, before we had the COG and it was up to the council at a budget hearing to decide whether or not we were going to give money to a very worthy organization. And I remember budget hearings going on for hours over one $20,000 <laughs> a commitment and I think that's when we came up with the COG and they they do a fantastic job of, of looking at everything and and I, I applaud you for working with them um, one thing though uh, looking at these lists of organizations that are called regional I really look over these and I kind of think well we really need to know if we're going to approve one that's new coming in that it means they're going to get it for every year from now on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I mean, I think looking at some of these, I'm thinking that I thought they were a one-time thing, but what, what we're finding out is that they have become an every year thing unless we say otherwise. Oh, yeah, so Council Member Henley, there are some, like some of them on there, like at least from my understanding so mr. Rouse let me know if you think I'm wrong but friendship village was a one-time one grant mm -hmm. so there are some of them that have prevailing contracts that council approved that have different terms to them in general the majority of them do not have an underlying contract and if they don't have an underlying contract the precedent in the history that has been the practice that has developed was they just are continued to be carried over in subsequent budgets unless council tells us otherwise but there are a couple of them that have underlying contracts or underlying understanding that was legislated by council to say one time or only for a finite period of time well i, I really appreciate you all doing all of this research and bringing this to us because it it uh, it's it's amazing how these things can grow yes. if we don't uh look out because it sounds to me like our regional grants far surpass the ones that we give out in COG and you know we might kind of want to uh, investigate a little bit more so I just appreciate all of this work I, I do have one question on your uh, on what we got in the packet mm -hmm. when you were the very last page with the following services were provided by COG funded organizations in the last fiscal year 
uh, they repeat. Did you intend to put the same ones twice? In what page is that on? Or, or is there some reason that these numbers were repeated? You can look at that later. <laughs> it, was a it was a mistake. <laughs> oh, it was a mistake. Okay. Yes. So actually, these were just a, a one time, and then we can cross That's over. That's right. Okay. Uh, it, that, that I appreciate that. Okay, well, I, I think this is a, a, a good bit of information for us to look at going into the budget, and every single one of these is, is worthy. There's no question about that, but I think, you know, we do have to to look at where we, we get if we don't watch out because things do grow. But I, I think this certainly attests to the fact that the city of Virginia Beach really looks a lot to our nonprofit organizations and they accomplish so much for us that if we had to do it with our staff, we would never be able to do it. And I, I think it's good that the city can be a facilitator with some of these nonprofits that they are doing things that, that are very important in, in this fashion. So, but, it, but this is a lot of good information that we need to consider. And thank you very much for all of your work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Mr. Raps. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have any questions. I, you just look fairly new. I noticed, <laughs> and so I'm assuming this is your first time presenting. This is my first time presenting to council. Well, you did say, great. You did <laughs> I appreciate awesome. it. Great job. <laughs> Would you repeat your name? Michael Evans. Thank you. I want to great. see you on this. Thank you. Great job. I appreciate um, it. As Councilwoman Henley stated, this is a lot of great information um, as well, and um, looking forward to see you present um, sometime soon. So I appreciate it. Job. Thank you. Right. Yeah, Mr. Moss. Well, I presented some feedback in the email to uh, the city manager, but uh, but welcome. Thank you. I can remember when we set up COIG and Nancy Park and I were the first liaisons to this group. And one of the things that wasn't clear and it probably changed during my departure and coming back is the COIG money always went and no one got a COIG grant for more than three years. And they were very precise, had very precise performance metrics and I hope that's still the case. I don't know. So it looked, I couldn't tell from this thing is whether or not people were getting recurring money for the same recurring thing or they were coming up with new projects. But the idea was that people had a need. They wanted to prime the pump or help them prime the pump. But they had a plan where they were going to be off the grant and on sustainable revenue. So what's the turn? I'd like to know what the turnover is in the COEG grants in terms of projects. And are we really achieving that we're priming the pump or now we're just feeding the same pump. I would kind of like to know that if we're getting, you know, innovation. And I, I like to pick up on Mrs. Henley's well, thing about. I'd like to follow up on what you're saying. Please. How do we know, how do we decide which become regional grants and which continue to be COIG grants because <coughs> they're the same ones every year? There's, there's got to be a distinction here. You're right. Oh, you're on my next question. Very good. You're on the same <laughs> thought. And on the. The regional grants, if we think we're changing, the time to communicate that is before the manager recommends something rather than when we get the recommendation and then we want to make a change. That seems like that just uh, puts the manager and us both in, a, in that nutcracker there. That's not a good idea. So I don't know that we do or don't, but what I'd like to know as an assessment is what's the outcomes that we're getting? Because a regional grant, it's in that long, I think I know about the hospital. That's just recurring indigent services, and you're just going to tell us that. I remember how that came about. But for each of these grants, what is the outcome? And maybe if that's our allocation, maybe we ought to have some part of regional grants that aren't forever either, so you get some turn, some disruptive influence that spawns. Every organization can get addicted to sustained revenues and lose its uh, zeal to, to innovate. So I don't. I realize that's hard from a policy analyst, but since you are an analyst, <laughs> you can. I'd like. I think we all would appreciate some insight about the regional yeah. groups, and do we have the right balance between the region and the local, and are we have the right balance for spurring innovation and getting people to go out and, and get off the grant and get onto the sustainable revenue, which means they have customers willing to pay for their service. But in some cases, like indigent healthcare, they can't pay. So I got that. But I do think it's probably worth a turn based on your fine work to figure out, you know, what are the outcomes we're getting? And could we make some shifts and give the COE group some more flexibility 
right. on the resources that they have give them more discretion because that's one thing I know that Mrs. Parker and I always liked is that we tried to make sure we had a certain volume of money not locked up right but if you lock it up for the whole three years you really have no decisions to make once you give a grant and you really can't see what else is out there but I, I welcome aboard where'd you come from so I've been with the city for going on three years now um, I was a budget analyst in the city of Hampton prior to this well Welcome to the South Side. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Valucci. Thanks, Mr. Evans, for being here. I don't really have any questions, but I, I do have a, a comment and a, just a couple of reflections. First, I want to thank Mrs. Henley for her comments about the role that nonprofits play in our community. As a person who has spent my professional, most of my professional life working in nonprofits, I, I agree with your characterization of the important and efficient role that nonprofits play. And I think we saw evidence of that in um, the VB relief uh, pandemic partnership that um, Mr. Moss was really instrumental in helping to shape. And, and I'm grateful for that because what it did was it proved that nonprofits can deliver, not all, but many of the services that we rely on um, as, as a city uh, more, efficiency, more efficiently, more effectively, more impactfully, um, sometimes, not always, than city agencies can. And so um, I, I think that the role of nonprofits should, should not be underestimated. And that's why the discussions about how we fund them and, and, and how the city supports them is so instrumental. But I also want to make a point about support for nonprofits in, um, in, in a way that it's an investment, not only in services, but nonprofits play the same role that, um, that uh, many um, of our efforts at the city do. For example, we allocated a certain amount in last year's budget to support marketing for the Maya Lin exhibition that's upcoming at MOCA. And that, that initiative will support MOCA in marketing and promoting that exhibition. But in doing so, that's also promoting the city of Virginia Beach as a cultural destination, as, a, as, a, um, as another amenity that people can enjoy when they visit here, as well as that residents can enjoy for free. And when I look at this list of nonprofit organizations um, that are reflected here, they not only provide critical marketing support for how we define ourselves as a city, but they also pr provide many of the same functions that we actually contract other organizations, private organizations, to perform, such as the African American Cultural Center with their community festivals, um, public programming, Hampton Rose Pride, that that does public programming, um, the arts festival. We actually invest in, in uh, private contracts for people to do very similar programming, although this is, not, and not to take anything away from the organizations that do that, but this is authentic, cultural, grassroots, homegrown, and it positions our city in a very, very positive way. So I think dollar for dollar, these are very, very smart and wise investments. and. Uh, I'm not advocating any expansion or contraction of the funds, but I just want to really um, be an advocate for the impact that this uh, level of support for our city's nonprofits can have for our city, quality of life for our city, and also to support what we're already doing um, in terms of promoting our city and making programming available on a, base, a widespread basis to residents and visitors. So thank you very much. Okay, anybody else at this point? Ms. Wilson. So, Mr. Moss brought up something that I was really not aware of, that we're only allowed to give grants for three years, and then do we, at that point, we reconsider, or what, what happens? So, each year, the organizations basically start anew. So, they all apply each year. They submit <laughs> the programmatic uh, changes they'd either like to make. Some organizations submit for COG funding for general operating expenses, but most of the time it is for a specific program that they'd like to implement. Now we do have grant or organizations that have received the grant in consecutive years, um, and we can get a list of those to you. Um, but, but generally speaking, we, we do see the same pool of applicants year after year, pretty generally. Well, and I, I think that a, lo a lot of those if we didn't give them the money, they, we wouldn't be able to get the, the quality of the benefits that they're able to produce from them. So if that's the case, it's, I think it's okay if we give them for longer than the three years. And 
Um, I know the beach, I'll talk about the beach health clinic because it's not on here anymore because yeah. they've now gone away, but they provided a service to people who wouldn't have had that otherwise. And now there are other services now who they can get those services from, but there were so many people who, if they didn't have the beach health clinic, it would have been, it would have been a terrible thing. And that money that they received from us kept them going and it fulfilled a, a tremendous need in our community. Yeah. So I think that, yes, you don't wanna just let it go on forever if it's not, but that's part of the evaluation. It is, of, and they also submit performance measures each year showing how they've used those funds yes. too. So. so I think that's part of the evaluation. But, but thank you for what you do and we're glad to have you. And. Um, Todd does a, a wonderful thing, and it, and it the great thing too is it takes the politics out of it, which is really important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Well, like I said, I don't know what the policy is now. That's the policy when back in the late 80s when Ms. Parker and I were doing when we first set this up. But one of the reasons we did that, people would come to us and say, We'd like to start this service. Well, until they can qualify the service and Medicaid says they're a, a qualified provider they can't get Medicare patients and they can't get the cash flow that Medicaid would provide. So the grant would put them in the position of establishing the capability to be a certified billing agent. And once they were a certified billing agent providing the care, then the customer flow provided the income and the grant was no longer needed. And that was the case for many of those turn projects is you can't get the money until you're qualified, have the facilities to, to get the billing patients. So the the grant was the primer to get them, and the health clinic was one of those that we gave grants to, and once they could get qualified and certified, then the billing patients came in and they provided the source of revenue. And that was what we, I can't say what's happened since, but that was why we tried to make sure we had about 30 so percent of our money every year we start off, we could offer to fresh initiatives rather than just recurring expenses. That was the idea. To, to give people the ground foundation to become a sustainable organization providing a sustainable service. But qualifying for billing was always the threshold that we ran into, just to share you some insight. Uh, Ms. Henley. Do we have a, a follow-up step where the organizations provide a report back to say this is how we spent your money? Yes, yes. So each uh, grant recipient is required to provide financial and performance documentation after they've received the grant to show how it was used and to make sure that it aligns with their application. I, I know some of these, you know, were certainly regional organizations like the planning district and so forth, but yes. then some are, are small. Uh, so um, I, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this, and I hope you will continue with really examining these to make sure we've got things right because there have been a lot of good comments here about what we want to achieve because Michael is so right. You know, so much gets done through these partnerships and that's what they are. And, and we want to make sure, um, you know, we're, we're doing this right. And, and I know some have a very small amount, some it's grown significantly. So we kind of need to see where they are and maybe Maybe the COED committee is a good place to start for some recommendations if they see that we need to make any adjustments. Uh, because I think we don't, and maybe it might have been something we started with, but we're not doing now. It has to be for programming. It can't be for a building project or something like that. Is that correct? It has to be. That's right. There are restrictions on what they can use the funding for, for example, like the they could not use it as a pass-through to a larger organization. There, there's different requirements, and um, I can actually I have the guidelines. Um, they're actually posted on BBGov as well, um, and we can provide those to you that kind of show all the different requirements for those organizations. Well, if COEG members or you would like to make some recommendations, I think we're always anxious to hear some ways to improve things, but I think it, it's certainly a good, worthy uh, place to um, support. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I just want to thank you. You did an outstanding job for a rookie. I'll I tell appreciate you. it. Good yeah. stuff. <laughs> you know, really, really good. I appreciate it. Hey, you know, as much as government would like to and strive to, government cannot be all things to all people. And we count on organizations like the Faith Base and 
you know, the private organizations to come out that actually get in and work with specific communities. They know their community better a lot of times than we do. And I think, you know, this type of vehicle that we're using right there, where people come in and actually justify what they do up front, and this is what we can do, these are the deliverables, and for us to get it again next year, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I just tell you this is what a, another point of pride for the city of Virginia Beach, which makes us so unique and great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Dehaney, Mr. Mayor, members of council, at this time, um, Deputy City Manager Taylor Adams will come and present to council about um, requests for. Council guidance as it relates to putting out an RFI for our Rudy Loop. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Thank you, Mr. Duhaney. And uh, um, and as the manager just mentioned, um, I'll introduce the, as this is a council requested briefing. I'll introduce this topic, but uh, as we get to the end, um, I'll staff will stop short of making any formal recommendation here. As we uh, again. The manager mentioned or are looking for guidance from you on which uh, on uh, what potential next steps would look like that you would find ex uh, acceptable this is re um, regarding the Rudy loop um, so you can see it's uh, uh, in yellow there you have a uh, uh, a listing of of land that's been assembled by the city over the years um, you can see there's also a parcel that's owned by the Virginia Beach Development Authority uh, totaling uh, just over six acres. Uh, we want to talk about the resort area strategic action plan that was uh, um, from June of 2020. The reason we, f we feel that this is important to mention is there's been a wealth of public input that's been gathered on this site, a uh, number of charrettes that were that were done where where the um, where public input was gathered um, on on potential uses of the space. So uh, you can see here a couple of iterations that were in that document. Um, some uh, with uh, some levels of development, some using it as a park. Again, uh, uh, a second page from the same report to uh, to indicate varying levels of, of development and public space on the uh, on the parcels in question. Regarding an RFI, and and one of the things that that I I'll, I'll borrow something that I've heard from uh, from uh, some of you, uh, one of you in particular, a. Uh, where an RFI is typically a request for information, it seems that the, the thing that we were asked to bring forward was the concept of a request really for information and ideas. And so to speak to specifically what could be entailed in a document like that, um, we think a, so I've, the legal minimum here is 30 days, but as, as again, uh, we're, or in the neighborhood of 30 days, as we're gathering uh, uh, information and concepts and the community is not really aware that this was coming forward. Uh, we think uh, a longer period makes sense. We have 60 days here. It could be longer. It could be shorter. It's whatever you it's whatever you all prefer. But um, but one of the things that we or some of the things that we think that you could tell us to include in that potential concepts for the site, financial capability of the team that was uh, that was uh, that submitted the experience of that team uh, to include resumes and then current projects that are that were uh, that were underway. That said, I think I think it's important for me to stop at this point because we really need guidance from you on what it is you want us to do. Uh, for for example, um, your your own RACEP plan, right? RACEP plan speaks to varying levels of of development that could be reached, um, so, uh, and there's a spectrum there. Uh, one could be on you know one could speak to to Economic benefit, which, which would take you in one direction, another would be community benefit or the community value, which would be, which would, which would be on the other side. And so, um, with that, um, uh, and and I'm happy to answer more questions about the RFI. Should you tell us, should this, you, uh, should it be your will that we move forward? I do have some process recommendations that I would make, that, that were further to that. But at this point, I did want to stop and gather input from uh, from the body. Okay, at this point, yeah, I, I usually try to wait till the end to make comments, but at least I'd like to at least set the table because there were conversations that left to this with uh, myself, the vice mayor, Mr. Branch, and 
you know, this has been a controversial mm -hmm. thing for, dare I say, a couple decades right now. And the direction and, you know, the reasons for the dome site and Rudy Loop not being developed, uh, you know, that, that that's something that we have to live with. And I guess in a lot of ways, if we were to poll every council person, there might be a different vision about what we do. Uh, I have opposite visions of some of my colleagues, and some people have different ideas and visions about what we should see. So we try to at least come up with what we hope is a mechanism that is a fair process that's fair to not only the members of this council, but, you know, the people that may have an interest in this, and th that may be many. And the idea of going to an RFP, you know, let's be honest with, you know, with the potential that, you know, it's going to take a su super majority to vote and ask them to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars coming to go up with a plan may not be fair. But we were talking about it, and I get, you know, uh, you know, a big champion of this was, uh, you know, the you know, um, vice mayor. But the idea, the concept of ideas, and what could be, and what could be the win-win for us. And the other thing is, you know, when you get the process, the recommendation I think that has to be in there is it has to include the provision for green space and enhance fishing and surfing. And so, so Mayor, thank you for that. I, I heard a couple of things in there, and, and I'll work backwards if I may. First is, what, what I heard you say is, as it relates to the community amenities that currently exist on the parcel, is that you would look for us to, um, to rec speaking as an individual, you would look for us to lead or lean on um, the community benefit um, and, and preserving the community benefit with anything that we put out. Also, what I heard was, and I think that's an important point, should you all tell us to go forward, given, um, given the ways in which the sites were assembled, uh, uh, and, and I'll look to the attorney to, for confirmation of this, um, a supermajority of council would be required to, uh, to, uh, to sell, the, to sell this, or, uh, this real estate. Or lease. Or lease, Mark. Or lease it beyond forty years, yes. So, so, so a supermajority of of the body um, w would be required, and and Mayor, the the third thing that I heard you say there um, uh, was that uh, that you were recognizing that this is just a a phase that would gather input and ideas that you would want us to focus on minimizing the cost of respondents. Yeah, or two respondents. Yeah, but once again, to you know, give us um, you know some ideas. You know, but yes. once again, please understand this is also in the, the to facilitate public input too. You know, when we get these ideas that come forward, and uh, that I think that might be, uh, Miss Wilson. I, we have. This is such a special place, and we've been gathering. These parcels, it's 99, 98, Glenwood, do you remember? Somewhere about that? Well over 20 years, how about that? That's, <clears throat> and we've, we've, put, we've put it off because we had so many other irons in the fire. You know, we, we had the dome site and we had just all these sorts of things and we didn't want to do this when we had everything else going on. And so that when it came time to do the Rudy Loop, we could pretty much really focus on it. And I, I think that, and actually I had asked the mayor about us talking about this today. Um, I think that time is now. Atlantic Park is getting ready to get moving and we've, we've really checked off all those boxes of the things that we've wanted to do. So um, the other thing is, you know, I, I lived in, I can walk within five minutes to, to there. Yes, and to be the most spectacular place undeveloped on the East Coast, it is the most unspectacular place because it's in terrible condition. There's 
broken, I tripped one night on the broken concrete because it's just, it's a mess. It's a, it's a mess and, and there's a lot of there's safety concerns and it's, it's a shame that we have this magnificent mm -hmm. parcel mm -hmm. in the condition that it is. So I think the, the public deserves better. I think this really belongs to the public. <coughs> you know, it was their dollars. It, we purchased it piece by piece by piece, and it started out with the, with the Lighthouse Restaurant from Bob Herman way back when. And we've gathered all these pieces, and now, I mean, we've got, counting the roads and everything, 11 acres. So I, I think that this is the time um, and I think we're going to need a lot of public input. I know our mayor is, he is Mr. Public Engagement, always has been. And so once we gather people's ideas, um, I, I hope part of your process will be a robust public engagement. So this, this is their part, this is their land. This is, this was their investment. and. It's grown in value. I mean, an incredible investment that we've made over the years. So we need to hear from the public what they would like to see down there. I do think we're going to need parking. Whatever it is that we do, um, I think there needs to be part of a, a parking piece to this. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and as the mayor said, the people that are already using it, the surfers and the fishermen, and of course, you know, the, the kids that go down there with Gromit Park and, and all of that. So. I think it's an exciting time that we've been, I think Wavy TV, I saw them at noon today, or said, we've, we've been quiet on this thing for two years. Well, I think now's the time for us to start talking about it. Uh, thank you for your diligence. Th thank you, Vice Mayor. And if, I, and if I could, and just, and forgive me for cataloging this, but just given the importance of the, the parcel that we're talking about, and also my staff is going, is behind me sort of listening to these things to, to make a list. What I heard in addition to that, in, the, in addition to that was, um, again, to reiterate the importance of uh, preserving the existing uses, but then also the importance of public input um, on, on whatever process we bring forward, and then um, the likely need for uh, increased parking facilities for whatever, should you all tell us to go forward, for whatever use follows that. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yes, ma'am, thank you. And if I compose on Mr. Branch, uh, pursuant to a conversation we had, you were the one that said not only get information but ideas. Can you expound on that? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, Mayor, when you said we don't want people to have to go out and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to submit their uh, request uh, application in. But uh, I think you've got it right there, uh, Taylor. The, um, that's what I'd be looking for. Uh, give us give us your ideas um, you can expand on them somewhat but we don't need detailed plans or all those sort of things I think uh, there may be things none of us have ever thought of before that uh, someone might put forward and but I think this is a good time for that and I, I certainly agree with Miss Wilson when you walk that site it's a hodgepodge of ideas over the last 25 years there's a old basketball court there and some kind of sculpture up here and something else over here and it really is a beautiful piece of property that is probably time for a real makeover in some fashion so I totally support moving forward with this on a 60-day timeline this RFI okay anybody else Mr. Thank Moss? You, and then Mr. Rouse well I certainly would support a request that the scope was just to develop a park the memorandum that we got from the city manager said that citizens have expressed an interest in a park. Nowhere in that memo did it explicitly say that we were going out to ask for commercial development and a park. That's what this really is. And I, and I don't support commercial development of that site. I've said that over and over. We've had education campaigns on light rail that we thought was great, and the public you know, told us it wasn't so great. And I think we don't have objective public engagement. We have, I'll call them timeshare sales with engagement. What don't you like about this? But we ought to go out and ask the people what they want. And do they not want a park? So my position is until we have an advisory referendum that people say they don't want a park, they got that postage stamp park after, at 31st Street when they said they wanted a whole park. And this council didn't give them a whole, not this council, but this body didn't give them a whole park. They gave them a postage stamp, and then they leased it to the hotel operator. But 
So, the, and now we're talking about even buying open space without getting the details at the ocean front. So why would we be buying op open space at the ocean front and then saying we want to develop property at the ocean front? So I just want the public to know I'm not voting for any idea that doesn't make it all a park unless the public tells us, because it's their property, in an advisory referendum that that's what they want. Because I don't know what everybody thinks they want. But one way I know how you find out is when someone pushes the button or fills in a little op scan form and says what they want. Because that's what they got to do with light rail and they told us they didn't want it. I suspect if you go out and ask people, do they want this or that, they might say, no, we still want to park despite all the money it brings in. So I don't think this process is going to give you any more sense of where the public is, because they don't think they listen to, we listen to them anyway, as the same thing as the ballot box does. So I have no confidence in this process, but I'm not willing to vote to transfer it to a private entity or a lease, just so everybody knows where I stand. Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think, you know, as you, you stated earlier, Mr. Mayor, if you poll this council, everyone has a, a yet a different place on what to do exactly with Rudy Lou. Um, I am under the mindset and have always been and always will be um, one of open for ideas and opportunities, but having, as Mr. Moss would say, great public engagement um, as well. I mean, uh, Councilwoman, I mean, Vice Mayor um, Wilson stated earlier, uh, uh, tend to focus on Rudy Loop. Um, you know, I would even say broaden that, that focus. I understand, rightfully so, Ru Rudy Loop is going to come with a lot of focus um, because of the, you know, the location of it. But also, I think we should be open opportunities um, no matter where they may um, um, be, whether that's outside of the ocean front, whether it's inside the ocean front, around the city. Um, I, for one, is, is looking forward to how do we provide more parking um, at the ocean front. Um, another thing is, is housing. Housing is, a, is, a, is another big issue, um, particularly not just affordable housing, but also workforce housing um, to support our tourism industry. So, again, I think it would be a com incumbent upon us to, to let the opportunities flow in. We are open for business. Um, let the opportunities come in, but also understanding that we're, we're guided by public engagement. And so yes, um, that would be it's a, it's a RFI, and I have no no issues with the RFI, and I think it'll serve us well to to always be one that has an open door policy because we are the gatekeepers um, as 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 we all as we are. So um, yes, again, I think uh, open to opportunity and, and ideas should. I think we should welcome that. <clears throat> Councilmember, thank you. Okay, Mr. Branch, and then Ms. Henley. Well, I, as a private citizen, sat on the 2019 Race App um, Committee. And it had a broad representation, business, community, civic leagues. Uh, I think there was probably about 15, 20 people on it. Um, a year's worth of meetings. And on this particular site, uh, keeping an open space was the one thing that everybody agreed on. And so uh, uh, I hear what Mr. Moss is saying. I look at this as a, as a way to begin that process to just have the public weigh in one more time on, on, on this piece of property. It is a significant parcel, but we always had the vision that after uh, the dome site was, was adjudicated that we would uh, move forward on this site. And I think, like Ms. Wilson said, the time is now. So I am going to support that with the intent on hearing from the public and what they want when we get all the submittals in. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Henley. <clears throat> Just to, uh, to be clear, <laughs> I, I uh, am one of those folks that thinks this is a fantastic piece of property and I like it the way it is. It just cleaned up a little bit. But I am willing to listen to, to others and I just want to make sure everybody, everybody that sends in an, a, a description and everything else understands we are not committing that we're ready to go do something right now. We yes, are just looking for input. and. If we don't go forward, it doesn't mean that we are changing our mind or violating any promise or anything. We're just right now saying, okay, give us some ideas, but we're not committing that we're going to put out an RFP after we get these in. Yes, ma'am. 
Okay. Yes. Write ma that down. Well, so and <laughs> and, and, and that's correct. That and good. and I think I and uh, Miss Henley, if I may, I think I think I see where where the majority of the body is going to be sending um, staff, and so uh, I will have Mayor, if if I may, at the end, just a few sort of. I won't call them recommendations, but just thoughts that I'd like to have your opinion on to ensure that we're operating within your intention. Okay. Anybody else at this point? Want to give those points now? Okay, Mr. Rapp. Lastly, if, if I could just reiterate, I, again, I, I understand <laughs> the history that comes with this property um, as well. Um, I just want to make sure we, we, we don't just have tunnel vision when it comes to the opportunities that may come before us. Um, and I just want to make sure we're, we're just open to to opportunities um, and, and that we, we don't miss opportunities by just focusing in just primarily on Rudy Loop um, as, as well. So I just want to just make that yes, point. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so, so Mayor, if I may, and so one thing I heard um, from Councilmember Branch in his comments was that uh, was general support for the, for the 60 day clock. Just, just so the public knows, that's not 60 days from you all telling us to do this today. We do have, we've got a document that we've got to finish. The attorneys would need to review that. There's got to be time um, um, ads reserved in the pilot, and that. And so, so in truth, it is probably 60 days plus, you know, seven to 10 days from now, and hopefully sooner. Just um, we've got to book the time in the pilot, and we we don't ever want to get ahead of this body. And so, we did not do this, not knowing where you would send us. So, so just I just want to be clear, since I understand this this action will get public attention. It's not 60 days from today. There'll there'll be we've got some some eyes to dot and t's to cross, but there will but uh, but we'll move expeditiously in that space. If you if you should tell us to move forward too, um, I do think a, a way that you that we could clearly telegraph your intention to not be bound to a future phase, to not. Um, Put developers in a place where they are incurring substantial cost, um, and and also to ensure that that our timeline could be met. And and I will tell you, we may still, as as the market is not aware this is coming, and teams have got to be formed. You may very well get a a a, a request to add two to three weeks to this process. I, I don't know that. I'm just. It's not uncommon that that would happen. But it might be appropriate to consider a limitation on the number of pages in submission. That there is clear precedent for that in the in the broader marketplace, and we would, um, if and especially given that a supermajority of this body is required for any next steps, we we, I would recommend, perhaps consider consideration of yes, sir. I, we're in the same place. Somewhere between ten and twenty. Somewhere between. So ten ten is where. Um, Ten pages is where I was at. Um, my staff has said, "Well, do you think ten is enough?" I would just tell you a limitation makes makes a lot of sense in this space. If you all trust us at the staff level to fix that. One final thing that 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 uh, and I, I heard you loud and clear on pres on preserving the uh, basically as we put our document together to lean on community impact as opposed to purely economic impact. Which again, I think that's a great. Um, that is a uh, that's a great piece of advice for the broader marketplace, um, and then and then finally one other thing that I think is important to note, the submissions that we're going to receive here are public information, and even at the concept phase, there are developers that will really work hard at pulling this together. Um, one of the things that we could consider is requiring that some, and I don't want to get ahead of you, but but I would say. In the event that you chose to move to another phase, um, the broader market will have the luxury of knowing what your proposals are at that point. So it might make sense to consider requiring submission at this phase to be considered in any future phases. Now, again, that is not something staff would ever do without, without clear direction from you, but that is something that can be contemplated and we think it, it in some ways protects potential intellectual property, not not intellectual property in a legal term, but just the ideas of, of developers that are, or uh, community groups or whoever that may respond to you at this point. And and I would ask for guidance on that. Can I ask a Mr. question Mark. as to what that means? Because we went through this once before, and, and 
the city attorney wrote an opinion on my request. It went to the FOIA council. It came back with a different answer than what we thought we might get. And so as soon as we are in receipt of those proposals, they are FOIAble. Are you suggesting that somehow that by making some kind of other term, they would not be subject to yeah. FOIA? I was, no. I was trying to understand the significance of what yeah. you said. I'm no. just so, trying. So, council member, to your point, I'm assuming that they are FOIAble. And so, if there were five respondents to this initial RFI, I, um, their work product will be FOIAble. And so, if we then did an RFP, the entire marketplace would have the benefit of the work of those five. One of the things you could consider to, and I think would get you probably more comfort in the broader marketplace, mm -hmm. if, if people knew that responding to this phase was a qualifier for any future phases that you considered. Understanding you could always shut the process down and start over, but it just, uh, I don't know, it's, it was just a thought we had. But what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to understand, if we went out with an RFP, meaning that automatically they would meet the minimum standards of anything that we issued with the RFP, I'm trying to understand the, legal, we treat, the legal meaning of that expression. So, so our thought process at the staff level was that we would, if your RFP was a subsequent phase within this same process, then the RFI could, in effect, be the gateway to that process. You could also tell us that that it's just the that they're separate. They're totally they're totally separate phases. I understand what you're saying, but I can see Dana's behind you. I just yeah, like good. To he, Dana's who I need in, in this in moment. I'm glad he's here. In the state's procurement regulatory policy, what does uh, that? Here we mean? go. Here I come to save the day. <laughs> Tying the RFI to the RFP is only a, a practical consideration if the backbone of your transaction is a land transaction. Is that, that what kind of A land transaction. A land transaction. If at the end of the day, the land remains publicly owned and what you're actually purchasing is construction or design, then the two processes would be completely separate. The RFI would be, if nothing else, than a scoping or a public input document. And then when you actually went to market for the construction or the design or what have you, that would be a standalone process that is compliant with the Procurement Act. Okay, I knew there had to be a meaning. I was just trying to get to it. Thank you and, very much. And here's can where I this matters. You know, Ms. Wilson. Here, here's, oh, can yes, ma'am. So, oh, so here, here's where this how matters. How do you do the public input if it's... Well, so that, that's how just it. How are you going to open that up to the public to, to comment on if it's proprietary? So th and so we're not saying it would be proprietary. What we're saying is, um, to Dana's point, the reason that we're talking about super majorities is we would contemplate that whatever action comes next has a real estate component to it. It might make sense to tie the phases together at that point so that we can do the robust public input that you want without developers feeling that their concepts are at risk to be well, taken by other developers. Okay. To Dana's point, if, if this is going to be something, if we're not contemplating a real estate transaction, then, then none of this matters. But the whole reason that we're talking about Supermajorities, we think that real estate is a likely component of where this goes. So we think it, we think it's, we think it's worth consideration of protecting those ideas so that we can have the public input, and we think that gets you the broadest set of ideas. Thank you. And Ms. Henley? Since Mr. Moss brought it up, uh, the 31st Street experience uh, that some of us had, mm -hmm. um, those of you who weren't around then need to do a history lesson so that we don't repeat any mistakes. But as I recall, we had already agreed to the sale of the property and the use before the public did a publicly required referendum. And we knew that we couldn't do what they were asking because we had already agreed to the sale. And so even to this day, we have people who think we didn't listen to what the public wanted in the referendum, but the truth of the matter was we had already agreed to the, the sale. So it may be that at some point we do want to put a question on the ballot <laughs> about whether or not the people want this to stay, whatever. But just kind of watch everything and make yes. sure we don't do the same. You, you, you learn from your mistakes. Make sure we don't make the same mistake twice. So, so yes, ma'am. And, and actually, though, and, and Dana, 
as always, thanks for coming up. And, and I'll admit, I've probably not done the best job of communicating what we're trying to accomplish here. But one of the things that we're, that, that we're trying to do with this potential provision is prevent exactly what you talked about, so that we could do the public input, so that, so that the public would fully understand potential uses. I mean, in the event that there was a real estate component, would fully understand the, the potential uses, the potential massings, that we could share all of that with the public before we went to a next phase. Now, recognizing you could always shut this process down and start over. I mean, or do nothing. I mean, that's, I mean, that is, that is, you were sort of, I mean, you're, you're driving at that point, but, but we did think it made some sense to try just as a courtesy to, to ensure that people that were coming forward in good faith with ideas at this point weren't unnecessarily exposed to risk of have, having others use those ideas to then compete against them. That's true. And Mr. But, Moss. Who's developing the status quo case? Because this says financial capabilities. Well, this is designed for real estate transaction. But if the public's going to be having an analysis, who's preparing the view that it's city-owned, city-developed, and is a park, and providing that alternative picture? Who's presenting? Because that's in the choice spectrum. So, 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 council members, thank you for the but, question. That's but who's developing yeah, that? That's that's largely what's keeping me up at night right now. In the event that you all tell me, tell us to go forward with this, I I would most certainly be standing up here with a request for funding to hire someone to help with that piece. Because I'll admit we're so this is a um, we're uh, as this is a request that came to us from you. We're we're working to, we're working to get to get to that space. But I mean, I, I would most can't, certainly can't have to have some help. But I'm posing it for the public that's yes, listening. Sir. When people are talking about comparison, all this is about what it could be if it's commercialized with some open space versus what it could be if it was the oceanfront Central yes, Park. What would that look like? Yes. And people don't have a visualization or a proposal. Now, obviously, we talked about conservancy some time long ago. That got well received. Uh, <laughs> but that's how the Central Park and other places are done. But, you know, once again, it's... I'm just showing you that getting back to the process, it is a, it's a weakness and a flaw of the process because no one's there speaking and saying, here's the, here's the proposal that would come and for where well, there's no profit. I understand yes. why people have a profit, have a motivation. That's, that's, we have a capitalistic society. But no one comes forward. I don't see John D. Rockefeller out here buying the Grand Tetons and then giving it to the government. So I don't think that's probably that's right. out there. But I'm just pointing that out to my friends that there isn't that public total development perspective that would be delivered by this RFI. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Tower. Uh, again, for the benefit of those listening, the paragraph that you cited in the material that you gave us, Taylor, <coughs> and is part of the RACEP report, says, and I quote, additional investigation both of the costs and benefits of various alternatives for development of this unique property, as well as additional citizen input, is needed before any decisions are made concerning its future. Uh, I just want to make sure, one, you believe this is in furtherance of that, yes, of sir. that paragraph, what you're putting forward, and two, I think the word development here, I, I certainly, I, uh, because I was involved in this as well, I certainly meant that to include development, in, not in the economic develop, uh, sense of a, yes. of a contractor, but, but as, as the vice mayor points out, this property is going to need a lot of work to be what, it's, what it can be in its vision, whether it's public, whether it's private, whether it's some combination of the two. So I, too, would like to have um, make sure we've got a mechanism by which we get, as part of this process, this weighing of both the costs and the benefits of development. And I include in that development as totally a public uh, enterprise for pu totally public purposes and also some mix of public and private. I can't imagine we're going, uh, there's no one that I've heard has any interest in making Rudy Loop a private uh, 
turning it over to pri for pri total private development. So the only the only things that have been suggested are a, a complete public issue or some combination of public and private. So I, I, I agree with Mr. Moss. I think we ought to have, hopefully we will have some mechanism yes. by which we get that information from the public view of the costs, which would be significant to the public of, of, a, of ha having a park, as well as the benefits and the benefits, frankly, even if it's publicly owned, can be uh, can be economic yes. as well. Uh, I'm sure those who have investment in our current p private resort area would find this to be a very attractive development in terms of producing more revenue for themselves and more revenue for the city from the various taxes that we impose on yes. tourists, tourists and, and operators in, in the resort area. And so if I can, if I can quickly respond yes. to the question. Yeah, I, I, please do. Yeah, thank you. And so um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Councilman, for the question. Um, and so as I've thought about this over the past few days, um, preparing for, for this briefing, um, I think I, I, I have to, I've sort of thought about that, that paragraph specifically. And so recognizing that there is broader, and it's why we asked the question about economic value versus community value, and recognizing that the community value for this parcel is well beyond a purely economic sort of calculus. And so um, it's our hope that the public input that we would gather once, the, once, once these proposals are known will quickly get us to some understanding of, of community value. But, but as it relates to the economic value here, and this is the reason that I, I do think that, there, that it's likely that we will need, that we will need some outside help. Um, there's no, to Councilmember Moss's point, there's no way that I can standing here in front of you today tell you that these proposals are going to be tightly grouped enough that they'll be easy to evaluate um, most likely they will be they will not I mean we you've helped me today by by telling me to focus on the community side but but we will still probably have a wider breadth of a proposal than we're accustomed to getting in the public space and so in the event that we <laughs> that I am surprised and they're tightly grouped then, then it's then there's the possibility that with the team in finance uh, the city attorney's office and with budget management services as well as my own team we can we can get we can get to that pretty quickly although even in that space I think it would make sense to have somebody check our math and uh, but it is but it is likely that we will be hiring an industry expert to come in and help us understand that but I do think that we will owe that to the public before we make any public briefing on this okay. anybody else at this point mr. Jones it just seems to me like we you know we've been messing around with this property for years and we let people spend a fortune coming in with proposals yes, sir. on the property. And in the end, we don't, we don't allow them to do anything. That's what it comes down to. And I think we need to make up our mind what we want to do with it. Now, and I'm not sure we really have a united concept of what we want to do with it because I don't think we know what our opportunities might be yes sir and I'm willing to spend a little money to be honest with you to get somebody to get somebody who's good at this sort of thing I mean really good at this sort of thing and tell us what the possibilities might be and one, one of the things we need to tell whoever it is that we would hire as a consultant is what we don't want on the property. Yes, sir. Yeah. If we don't want a hotel on this property, we need to tell people up front we don't want a hotel on this property. And, you know, I'm just wondering if there might be somebody out there who can give us some concepts of what's going on in the rest of the world that might go <coughs> well on this piece of property yes. and you know we're so focused on tourism and, and all that sort of thing and I'm not sure that that's necessarily what's the best use of this piece of property I think 
a ma you know a major corporation headquarters, for instance, might be a good use of this piece of property. And uh, I don't know that. Yes, sir. And I don't know who might be interested in it, but it seems to me that it's worth looking into. Yes, sir. Rather than just, you know, right now we're all over the place. And we need to put, get focused if we want to make this property worth our value, worth, worth uh, being developed. And, and it may be we can combine it with a park, a, a development, with a developer. We don't necessarily have to get the highest amount of money out of this piece of property. Yes. What we want is a, is a development on this property or a use on this property that's going to be an amenity to the city. Yes, sir. And, and my view. So I think we need to get somebody in here who can tell us what's going on in the rest of the world on these kinds of pieces of property and get some examples of what's happening somewhere elsewhere before we start putting out an RFI and end up with a bunch of proposals that are not going to be what we want. Yes. So, so, so obviously that would so, thank you council member and so to do that obviously would be a a change in sort of what we've been talking about here it would like um, so so I would I would just sort of ask if it's the will of the body that that we do that there um, we would one have to do um, we would we would have to do a procurement for a consultant um, we'd, we'd need an appropriation to support that procurement um, I'd have to work with uh, the um, with Dana and the team in purchasing to sort of to go through the process of, of uh, hopefully with your input to hire that consultant, and then we would we would gather their work product before um, before we moved forward with any other phase. Mm -hmm. And so, certainly that is something that we can execute if it is your will, Ms. Wilson. I think it's my opinion that at this point we should reach out and find it. This is a lot of people are going to know about this to find out what comes in. And at the end of the day, if we are not happy with what we see then maybe go to the, a, a different step. But uh, I, I'm all for proceeding as we talked about. Okay. You know, if I could, you know, just bring uh, something, hopefully then we can start moving to uh, the decision <laughs> mode. I think ultimately, um, you know, I don't think, get, considering the value of the property, the location of the property, a binary decision, you know, park or no park, you know, it may not be in the best interest. That's not to say that at the end of this process, okay, Ms. Wilson and I got a philosophical difference, and I think <laughs> what we're looking at is a possible, you know, uh, blending of spirits. And that's why, if you recall, up front, I said as part of the criteria of this, that green space is a major component of it, along with the enhancing of uh, fishing and surfing. Okay, I think that I think that's mission essential. And I think, you know, as we look at this, we want it to be a destination for people, not only tourists, but the people that live in the 757 and the people that live in Virginia Beach. That brings us out here. When you think about the energy and synergy that you're gonna have with the sports center, the revitalization of the convention center, the vibe, uh, Atlantic Park, and some type of de destination, which I think is going to help the southern part of Atlantic Avenue, and actually contribute to the revitalization of it. And uh, but once again, I think by, by at least testing the waters, and uh, you know, I think what we're trying to do here is stick our toe in the water, see what the temperature is. We are not going to be bound up by anything. And once that comes in and we solicit the public input, and if you recall, you know, bring up, uh, you, know, you know, some bad history, 
You know, we actually had two competing groups for the arena, and we brought the public in. And don't forget, we also, with Atlantic Park, I think had more than 30 engagements. And the thing is, you know, let's be sh uh, sure of one thing. We're not going to make any decisions based on what, uh, yes. you, know, com you know, we got time. You know, once Atlantic Park got the green light, we're still four years out. This is not going to happen this year, next year. You know, but once again, this is playing chess, not checkers going forward. And let me just say by conclusion, I think um, Aaron Rouse hit it exactly on the head. It tells everybody, at least we're open for business. We're, we're willing to listen to any idea that people may have. You know, as we're looking forward to a robust future with a lot of the economic development uh, things that we got. So um, at this point, I think I can say, um, you know, I, we got to be careful about bowling, that Mark voting and polling and everything, but could we have a verbal interest in this? Maybe I, go around the table. I think I got what I needed. You, you certainly can go around the table and talk. Okay. No, but what's the will of the body? I'm open. I'm what are you asking? Think about you know, you know, basically. Okay. Okay. At this point, is there? A, you know, let's just hear the objections to moving forward with the RFII. Is there anybody that objects to that? I do. Okay. Okay. All right. I think. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Once I think again, I know what to do. Once again, I think this is going to be the fairest process, and, you know, it, it'll provoke discussion. Yes, sir. And at least give us a path to move forward. Thank you. And, and, and Mayor, is, is it safe to assume that you all would like to see the final copy of this document before it publishes in your Friday packet? Without question. Thank okay? You. Okay, thank you all for that discussion. Okay, and then uh, Mr. Dehaney. Mr. Mayor, members of council at this time, Kathy Warren from our Economic Development Department will give you a presentation on our microtransit pilot program. Okay, good evening again, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council. I realize I'm the last one this evening, so I'll, I'll try to be brief. But tonight we're bringing an exciting opportunity to test a microtransit project in the resort area beginning hopefully this summer with your permission. So to provide some background, again, and you heard a lot about the race app tonight, but the race app was adopted by council in June of 2020. One of the race app's top priorities was to complete a mobility plan for the resort, which was supposed to focus on trans the transportation network, vehicular circulation, shared mobility, and pedestrian safety. The resort area mobility plan, or RAMP, as we refer to it, began in August 2020, and we are nearing completion. With stakeholder input, the RAMP recommends enhanced shared mobility services at the resort, again, to improve circulation. The RAMP Steering Committee and the Resort Advisory Committee, or RAC, are in support of and requesting that a one-year pilot program is tested this summer to provide microtransit services. So what will microtransit provide? It's environmentally friendly. Uh, it uses compact electrical electric vehicles, door-to-door -door year round service with flexible routing, convenient and easy to use on-demand service, open to all businesses and attractions within the resort, not just Atlantic Avenue, it's equitable access to all users, it expands transit service into the neighborhoods within the resort area for residential use, and it re reduces the re reliance on curbside parking and opens those spaces to other users. Project goals, our hopes are that this will reduce the demand for single occupancy vehicles, promote the park once strategy to reduce parking demand and traffic congestion. Drivers of these vehicles serve as ambassadors within the resort area and for Virginia Beach. 
provides door-to-door -door service by driving customers to the front steps of our local businesses and attractions and promotes clean energy and reduces carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. It is important to note that the ramp and the Transportation, Parking, and Pedestrian Committee, or TPPC, which is a committee of RAC, heard at least a few microtransit companies come in this past year and make presentations. Of those companies, the most attractive model was Freebie, and they happen to have a contract with St. Pete Beach, Florida, which the city, if we so choose, uh, can ride that contract and implement a pilot program for this summer. So this is what one of those vehicles look like from the Freebie Company. <laughs> it will be totally branded Virginia Beach. It's a six-seater vehicle. This company was established in 2012. Currently, it has 90-plus vehicles and is expanding. And it's active in 20 communities, which you'll see on this map here. Service areas in this area, and this currently is all in Florida, but again, they are looking to expand in other markets. So they go to resort areas, as well as the beaches, and of course, residents and businesses. So we're proposing with this model, as part of the pilot, that the ride is free to all customers. The customer can hail a ride, call for a ride, or use the app to request, request a ride. And this is what a proposed freebie pilot program would be. The funding would be for five cars operating at 12 hours a day. Now that's just a model. We can adjust that based on the season. So we can have more vehicle, we can have the five vehicles operating for more hours during a day during the summer and the busiest times, and then scale it down when it's the winter time. It will be geofenced within the resort area, so these vehicles cannot go out of that area. Freebie, it's a turnkey project. So Freebie establishes their operations, they obtain their insurance, their permits, they do all of the hiring and marketing, and they will set up their charging stations, stations within our garages. This map here shows the boundaries for the project. Again, this service is geofenced within the resort area. Again, not just Atlantic Avenue. The vehicle cannot travel on roads exceeding 35 miles per hour. And it is a service for our residents, businesses, and visitors. Just to show VB, excuse me, Freebies growth over the last several years in 2016, their total ridership was 47,234 all the way to 2021, which is currently 391,125. So they're showing rapid growth over the last six years. We did want to compare this to the HRT trolleys that are fixed route along Atlantic Avenue. You will note there is a decline in ridership. In 2018, they had just over 233,000 rides, bringing you to 2022 at 82,756. The data we're hoping to collect from conducting this pilot program would be, of course, ridership and demand average passenger wait time, cost per passenger, average trip length and duration, operational uptime, vehicle and passenger safety, community and stakeholder input, which is very important, compatibility with the fixed route transit that's currently in place, and impact on vehicular circulation. One of the things we're really looking at as part of this pilot is how does it maneuver around Atlantic Avenue if we are to to move the uh, sidewalks out and increase the width of the sidewalks for our pedestrians to have a more pedestrian friendly environment. And then with your direction, potential next steps could be 
that City Council approves a one-year pilot program and appropriates $550,000 from the Parking Enterprise Fund. The current fund balance there is $5.4 million. Uh, the City can then ride after negotiating the St. Pete Beach, Florida contract and engage with Freebie to begin service for a program beginning Memorial Day of 2022 and it would operate for a year. And with that, I'll take any questions. Right. Um, Ms. Uh, Wilson and then Mr. Holcomb. So I, I, I really like it. Um, I think it's, it would be great. This, this small groups travel together anyway. We don't need a big bus. My, my one question is, and this is probably kind of uh, silly, but do we have any input? I think, it, I think it's a very cute little vehicle, but is there any input in the, the way it's painted or is this? We have complete input. So we could do something that's a little bit more attractive than this. Yes. Wave or more beachy looking or something. I certainly. Uh, but I think the vehicle itself is, is very cute. So I, I like it. I don't know if it violates billboard ordinances. That was HRT's in trouble. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you said it's six riders. Does that include the driver? Because I yes. read here with, okay, so it's five. Yes. It be five other than, and let's say that this vehicle parked uh, a few blocks back from the oceanfront and I had my family and I want to take it to the beach. Does it have storage back there for like my chairs and a cooler or something like that? Or is that, is that available, you think? I mean, it could I, be a good question. We would have to see. Yeah. Um, currently with the way it, it looks, it doesn't, but I don't know if there's the ability to have any racks yeah, put on that, those. That would be a question because if you parked, you know, several blocks back and you need a ride. Yep. <laughs> good point. A roof rack. Something. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Or a trailer. Yeah. Put a trailer. <laughs> put a trailer behind. <laughs> Since we enter into pilots hoping that they're successful, and I know this council is concerned about on grocery tax sustainable sources of revenue, so I know we'll be equally concerned about how we plan to fund a successful pilot or why would we do it, right? Right. So what is the plan? Is Are we looking at that we're going to be increase parking fees and the parking system is going to be the, the source of mm -hmm. subsidy for this service? Or are we anticipating a special service district? Are we going to be asking the public to take unrestricted general revenues to finance that? Because I think when you enter into a pilot, you ought to assume that you're doing it because you've looked at it, think it's going to be successful. So you have the transition plan because why start the pilot if you don't know how you're going to sustain it? So I'm asking the sustainment question, and I also would hope, I know we're getting these memos now, but I hope we can get the memos and the briefs, because this brief answered some of the questions that the memo did not, and I hope in the future we can get both, because that helps, but I am interested in this. What is our plan for sustainment upon its success? So it, this conversation has not taken place as far as a dedicated funding source for this but I would say that this could be a possibility for the TIP program going forward, depending on how it's received and how well it functions. Because this, this would start, when would the, the one-year period end? The summer of next year? Yeah, it would end right before Memorial Day, unless we could get a potential extension to keep it through just the season, that season, and then make a decision in the so fall. I'm trying to think through, Mr. City Manager. So we're funding this whole amount in this allocation, funds that 12-month cycle. Correct. So it's not in this budget cycle of May that we approve. It'll be the 23-24 budget. Mm -hmm. So sometime after the first full summer of looking, before, as part of that, before January, you'd be coming back and saying, having some discussions about what, how we would permanently fund this service, right? I'm just trying to think of the timeline, sure. and, and, I, and I appreciate your candor, and I, and, I like, and I know I'm glad to hear you say that you're planning on it being successful, because I hope it is. I've been talking about fair, free public transit for some time, and I do believe Vice Mayor's right. People, small groups, people want to travel on their schedule not waiting for a bus. And this certainly meets the criteria of meeting the need of the customer rather than the customer adapting to the service. So I applaud you for your research. And I'm sure some of you may know what happened in Las Vegas with the boring company with Elon Musk 
they put the underground boring thing and they have these rotate they have these Tesla vehicles that mm -hmm. move people from the various convention sites and the various hotels all financed by the hotel tax of Howard Inda. But it's a pretty unique operation. I haven't been out there to see it. I've only watched the YouTube videos of it. But pretty impressive op operation. I applaud you for the innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll report it. Okay, Mr. Bellucci and Mr. Harouch. Thank you, Ms. Warren. I, I certainly uh, appreciate and and uh, and can see the potential in a in a project like this. And I, I think um, moving forward with a pilot is a good idea. Um, I just want to make a couple observations. The first is downtown Norfolk has a program similar to this called Free Ride Every Day, mm -hmm. and I think the vehicle is very similar. I don't, I don't, I don't know if they own the um, the vehicles or if they contract with the firm similar to what you've presented here, but uh, I would recommend, if you haven't already, reaching out to the Downtown Norfolk Council that operates what they call FRED mm -hmm. um, and find out, you know, what are, what, are, what are some of the challenges they've had, what are some of the things to look out for, uh, because they're operating or, or are people availing themselves of the opportunity. I certainly think they would at the resort, so I think it's a different, mm -hmm. it's not an apples um, to apples comparison, but I, I do think that there are some lessons we could glean from what they've done in downtown Norfolk and other communities, which I'm sure has been part of your analysis here. So I appreciate that. Um, I'll, but I do want to make a point, and, and I'm not in a position to speak about Hampton Rose Transit. Maybe Mr. Rouse is about to do that very thing. Um, so that'll be a perfect segue. I'll try to set you up for it. Um, but I know, I know Mr. Moss has looked at this too. One of the things that I learned from um, the discussion we had about scooters at the resort, and, and I heard some gasps there, but I, I do think, but, but wait a minute though, there are some benefits that came from that. This is the big one. <laughs> there, there were benefits that came from that that relate to what they call first and last mile. And I think people in my district do still have difficulty getting to and from their home and the access point to public transportation. So I would just say, not, not taking away from anything about this, but one of the things, we have a lot of stakeholder groups who are advocates for moving something like this forward through ramp and through other aspects, and I, I appreciate that. But I think we don't have always the um, stakeholder groups, other than civic leagues, and they do a great job, who can advocate for the neighborhood interests as well. And I would just say, not to take anything away from your work here or from this um, microtransit pilot project at the resort, that I, I would be very interested in exploring options for microtransit in neighborhoods, getting people to and from work, providing access to transportation for people with disabilities. Um, same, same community that we've talked about with mental health. There are a lot of people that don't have their own transportation that actually did use scooters to satisfy that first and last mile need. And I would be very interested if we're exploring uh, pilot projects, and maybe HRT is already on top of this, and I'll yield, uh, I'll yield <coughs> to Mr. Rouse at this point, but I think we need a neighborhood microtransit option as well as one for the resort. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Bellucci. Um, those are all great points, um, by the way. And those are something we have discussed at HRT, the first mile and last mile. As you know, um, there's a cost associated with everything. And if we're going to provide first mile, last mile within our city, we got to find a funding mechanism. That's why I'm so proud of this body when we support it. Um, actually, did not support the bills up in, in the state, uh, in the House, to take $20 million from Hampton Rose Transit and, and move it to Northern Virginia. But we have a dedicated funding source here. So that was very, very important. I just want to give you more information about um, this uh, micro transit that I have an email from yesterday, um, from Mr. Mark. HRT staff has been in the loop with the discussion of this program um, through the resort uh, area mobility plan ramp process. Um, the five electric cars that will operate 12 hours a day throughout the resort area are considered a supplemental um, service to the HRT that's operated on Atlantic Avenue trolley and a future Route 34, which will provide trolley circulatory service, uh, circulatory service from the oceanfront to the convention center parking lots during the summer weekends. Um, and so this is a supplementary um, type of uh, plan here, but I think we'll learn a, a lot from it, um, and, and particularly the first mile and last mile. Um, but I would also like to, to, again, advocate for funding mechanisms um, and finding ways, if, if the legislature is at the state 
and, and the state level, find a way to support regional transit here in Hampton Roads so we can make sure we can provide those services, um, those first and last mile services um, for our constituents here. Great. Okay, Mr. Brack. I'd just like to say a lot of work goes into getting this to this point here and a lot of subcommittee meetings. Mr. Tower and I get to observe a lot of that, but this is a lot of volunteer work shepherded expertly by Kathy Warren, Emily Archer, and staff. Thank you so much for bringing this to us. Thank you, Mr. Tower. If I could just add to what Mr. Brand, I want to add Mr. Freeze as well. It's been extremely uh, helpful in this process. Um, and we've had a number of meetings about this. And the intensity, uh, and, and we have all kinds of first and last mile issues that have been raised in neighborhoods and otherwise. But the intensity of the use of our streets, uh, including cur curb, curb space, mm -hmm. uh, is really hard to imagine unless you are down there experiencing it on a daily basis during the, the tourist season. Uh, it creates all kinds of safety and health problems as well as negatively impacting the experience of residents and out-of-town visitors who come to the area. We can't make, we can't really expand the size of our resort area very well. We can add features, we can refresh it, we can renew it, but it's very hard to add space as we're talking about. So we have to use it smarter. And to me, this is one of the real smart ideas about moving people around. We know that people drive to the res into the resort area that our own residents drive into the resort area and then make multiple trips in their cars when they get here. I mean, if you imagine that multiplied by all of the local residents who come to the beach, it can't be a great experience for them. I live within a bike ride of the resort area, so I don't experience it personally, but trying to move your car around to get from one place to another and moving it multiple times for one evening or one day out are just a real challenge. And this, find this the parking spot is yeah, <laughs> finding the finding the parking spot, paying for the parking spot. Um, it really and it 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 slows things down, but in some ways it also speeds things up because people get impatient and they do things in their vehicles that endanger themselves, <coughs> others, pedestrians, and like. So I think this is really going to be a, a tremendous help. It comes with a cost. Uh, and I think the resort area in terms of the TIP fund is certainly, uh, these are one of the things that I think the people that follow the TIP fund closely, and a number of people do, would find th this is what the TIP fund is for. And I don't, I, I really don't anticipate great problems uh, finding the funds for this if it is successful. I do think it's still a new idea. Uh, you know, this is, we say it's in Florida, but it's really in the Mi greater Miami area. I mean, this St. Pete thing just happens. And I was going to ask you, Kathy, about that. When you say ride that contract, that's just a backdoor way to get this done it really doesn't have anything to do with st pete itself st pete's kind of an outlier even in in the florida i, I just, do believe the contract though contract. is with st pete yes the contracts one of the contracts is with st pete right, and it's got is. that cooperative language in, with it yeah. i got it yes so, so we we're, we're taking advantage of a of just correct a, a contract provision that happens to exist in one of the contracts but if you look at the at the service area it's very very miami centric mm -hmm. But been quite successful there, would appear. I can't. Uh, yes, that's correct. In that area. Anyway, thanks for all the work the staff's done on this. This one, uh, I've got my fingers crossed, but I <clears> hope <throat> this is going to be a great project. Good. Anybody okay. else? Yeah, Ms. Wooten. Hey, good, good evening, Ms. Warren. Um, certainly, thank you for the presentation. And it does sound like it is certainly a, a very good program. It's very, um, I'm in support of it. But I would also like to advocate for um, some type of program. It, it, it may not be exactly this one, but maybe one that's a bit more um, efficient than what we have in public trans transportation and the buses throughout the city. Mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful 
to offer residents all over the city something just like this. Mm -hmm. um, because most often, I'm sure you, everyone knows, people take public transportation, most of the people, because they have to. Mm -hmm. And so we do want to make sure that we're providing this kind of convenient service for everyone. And so I certainly would advocate that for the whole entire city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I just want to thank you very much. Um, I think there might be a side benefit of this. Um, you know, this may also encourage a lot of the residents of Virginia Beach. I know, you know, being a district council guy for a long time, it was always a problem with parking and mobility and coming. We want everybody in the city to know this is their beat, too. Mm -hmm. And by coming out and making things a lot more user-friendly and, you know, you're able to get that mobility and, yeah, Rocky, be able to get the coolers and the bicycles and <laughs> the, the Harleys and a few other things. Uh, you know, I think it only helps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're about ready to, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. We're about ready to adjourn, but one quick announcement um, that we have forms that, we, as you know, we're putting together a, um, an independent citizen review board panel that is representative of the city. And we have, and we're soliciting uh, members of the community that, that we can achieve the diversity and the quality, but we have special forms that are out that are available online. So feel free to participate and we'll be getting more of that word out That's over time. I, I was waiting for approval from City Council at the next closed session for before okay. we put that out. Does anybody line. object? We said uh, that that was, we would wait a week. Could it be any problem? Were there, were there any other issues? Um, well, we revised it. Um, we sent it to the liaisons. Um, I haven't heard back. So I can send it out to all City Council tomorrow if you'd like or tonight for everybody yeah. to look at. Well, anyway, the public knows that it's coming very soon. Mm -hmm. And maybe to get in touch with your office if they would like to apply. And as soon as it's ready, you can give them a okay. copy. Yeah, Ms. Wooten. I'm, I'm going to to respond to you. I'm still gathering some information. Okay. Re you. Reviewing it out. I'll get some information to you. But I also, just really quickly, um, want to make sure that I've voiced this before, that we also pay attention to the fact that we still need to develop the infrastructure of this board. I think that's the essential piece before asking people to be a part of this. So again, I just really think it's essential that we look at development, budget, who this bo body is going to report to, training. All of those pieces are key elements to forming this board before we solicit uh, people to become a part of it. That's just my opinion, and my recommendation. Okay. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.